a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old time radio. And now, the Goldberg. Well, Molly's like an artist about to begin another composition. What we mean is that Molly's inspired by a plan which she wishes to execute. If Mr. Way could be persuaded to give up Oriane and return to his former wife, in return for her squaring the debt she owes the world, it would leave Dr. Cater and Oriane free to work out their own affairs. It's a plan to save a man's conscience, a woman's past, and the future of two charming and honorable people. But all such plans depend on fate keeping out of things. And fate is staggering around always at once. For instance, a little earlier tonight, Cater and Way, two of the men involved, had a run-in. And now as the Goldbergs come out of the movies, that run-in becomes a runaway. Where is Mama? She's talking to somebody. Where are you going, Mama? Come over here. Mama won't see us. She'll see us. But we are natural as the last right. time we go to the movies, Rosie. Please don't sit next to me. Why, what did I do now? Nothing. Well, what did I do? But tell me. Quiet, please. Did you ever sit next to her, Pa? So much as I Try it sometime. See how much you'll enjoy the show. <laughs> you do talk too much, Rosalie. <laughs> That's one thing I would say. Well, when did I talk? When didn't you talk? Oh, Come on. <laughs> I thought you got lost, Molly. Well, why did I get lost, Molly? I'm going to tell you. Such a wonderful picture. Are right. <laughs> we walking home or are we riding? We ride. If I should ride, let's walk. The moon is so silvery. See what the movie does to your mother? <laughs> Come, lock up. We all can walk uh, five in a row. All right, so I'll walk with Orianne and then walk with Papa Rosalie. All right, right, walk with Papa. So Rosalie's hat. Rosalie, please, button up your neck. Oh, Mom. Walk. Oh, so, so, so. We'll all be right in back to you, Papa. All right, Papa. Take Rosalie's hand. Take Rosalie's hand. Come this way, Orianne. Yes, but I don't see how you can do it. How can you? you? Don't do as I tell you. Don't go on as his Orient. Honey, can I? He thinks I'm going to marry him. But you're not married to Mr. Ray yet. You're not married yet. As much as Mr. Ray thinks he loves you, Orient, believe me, he loves the clear and the comfortable conscience more. Believe me. Look, who is it? I assure you, Orient, it will be a greater gift than anything else in the wide world. Don't forget that, Orion, please. Are you all right, Mom? Yes, you all right. Did you button your neck? Yes, Mom. Very well. But how do you know Mrs. Weber's giving all this money to the table city? If Mrs. Weber's the only thing to keep Mr. Ray from you. Why is she here in Lastonbury, Orion? Why is she staying here? Why is she seeing young Dr. Cater just to fill his head with all the terrible things Mr. Ray did to her? So, so it all comes out to plain arithmetic, Orion. Plain arithmetic. One, one is two, and two, and two is four, and that's all. Absolute. That's yeah, all, well, darling. The side of the car. Oh, there's a car. Come over on the side. Well, I think that's Dr. Cater. Dr. Cater. Oh, Dr. Cater. Yes, it's Dr. Cater. He, he must have been tired. Oh, 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 you two are oh, 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 no, I think... Oh, get in. Oh, you didn't. I wish I had room for all of you. Well, that's all right. Oh, Mrs. Goldberg won't mind. No, 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 not at all. I don't mind at all. Look out from the road, Sam. Look out. Come on. Uh, Come on. Uh, we'll see you at home. Oh, yeah. that's all right. All right, Sam. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Don't worry, I'll take care of David. Don't worry. Are you comfortable? Yes. Want me to put the window up? No. I felt like walking. And I felt like talking. But if you like, I'll park the car and walk with you. No, thanks. I haven't had a chance to see you alone for years now. Since yesterday. Well, it seems like years. After all, yesterday you promised to marry my friend, Edward Way. This isn't the road to the Goldberg. No, no, it's a roundabout way. Roundabout ten miles longer. 
But I'm tired. I have to look after David. Where is mothering him, and I want to speak to you. Aren't you in a rather masterful mood tonight? That's the moonlight. Moonlight makes me masterful. Now tell me, Orianne. Did you or did you not promise to marry Edward Wade? What did his wife say? His former wife said you did. How does she know? Wade told her and she told me, and now I'm asking you. Did you promise to marry him? What is wrong with Margaret Wade? Her former husband. And what is wrong with you? You. I can't think of a more preposterous situation. I know you're not in love with our friend. I know you don't want to marry him. I know you want to marry me. And yet out of pity, out of the stupid, sentimental pity, you wound yourself up with him and can't let go. You take a great many things for granted. I don't love you. I don't want to marry you. I never thought of it. And as long as I retain my reason, I won't. Ah, you're protesting too much. If you meant it, you wouldn't bother to say it. If you meant it, you wouldn't bother to say it. If you meant it, you wouldn't bother to say it. See, you forget, Orianne, you're talking to an eminent psychologist. You never let me forget it. No, seriously, Orianne, I don't believe you have promised to marry him. Just tell me yes or no. D- does Mrs. Ray love her husband? Ah, that word doesn't mean anything in the situation. If you mean, does Mrs. Way want her husband back, the answer is yes. But what for? To humiliate him? I suppose. After all, she sent him to the dogs once, and she'll be glad to do it again. She's jealous of you. Do you think Way loves his wife? That word doesn't mean anything in this situation. Do most married couples love each other? It's a waste of time asking the question. They stick to each other. They make sacrifices for each other. Many of them wish they could start over again with someone else. Wade would like to show Margaret that he can be happy without her and her bedeviled money. You are the champ. Does he love me? Again, the word has no significance. He wants an opportunity to show the world that he can be accepted for what he is without having to make up for the crime. And it was a crime that he committed. After all, if he has any human decency left, and he has, or you wouldn't pity him, he'd like to give back every cent he took and waste it. But since that's impossible, you're the next best thing. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Cater, since we are on the absurd subject, if love doesn't mean anything the way people use it, what do you mean when you say you love me? Did you promise to marry Way? I want to tell you something, Dr. Cater. The feeling I have for Mr. Way is part of the feeling he has for me. I know that he's a man who's reached the very bottom of human affliction and humiliation. His own wife refused to help him. His friends refused to talk to him. People who knew who he was wouldn't even do business with him. He was rock bottom. And now, because of me, that whole world has come to him backwards in his reach. I'm proud to see that I could do that for him. What are you going to do for him? Pity him? Pity him because society punished him for violating the law and cheating thousands of innocent people? Pity him in the morning and pity him in the night? And never forget, if you pity him, you don't love him. If you don't love him, he'll find you out. And if he does, he'll hate you. Because pity is the most outrageous condescension a man can receive. He'll hate you and despise himself. Then you won't be able to pity him. And your marriage will be a failure before it really gets going. And don't you think there are other things that can keep people together besides love? Things like respect, admiration, dignity, faith? Not when you love me. All the noble feelings in the world won't keep you and Wade together. You love me and you're afraid of it. You want to suffer. You're afraid to be happy. You're afraid to accept life. Suppose I am. Oh. Hey. Maybe I don't I want to get you home before Mr. Wade goes to bed. I want to hear you tell him in front of me why you're marrying him. Let me hear you tell him that to his face. Respect, admiration, dignity, faith. I'd like to hear you say it. But this is the very thing that would spoil Molly's plan. It's the very thing Orianne doesn't want. And it's the worst possible thing that could happen for Dr. Cater also. The psalmist said, When I awake, I am still with thee. For the child of God, seeking the presence of the Lord is essential as each day begins. 
To help you in starting this day with God, we offer a brief devotional meditation from Morning and Evening, a collection from the pen of one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This morning's text is found in Psalm 126 and verse 3. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Some Christians are sadly prone to look on the dark side of everything, and to dwell more upon what they have gone through than upon what God has done for them. Ask for their impression of the Christian life, and they will describe their continual conflicts, their deep afflictions, their sad adversities, and the sinfulness of their hearts, yet with scarcely any allusion to the mercy and help which God has vouchsafed them. But a Christian whose soul is in a healthy state will come forward joyously and say, I will speak not about myself, but to the honor of my God. He hath brought me up out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. The Lord hath done great things for me, whereof I am glad." Such an abstract of experience as this is the very best that any child of God can present. It is true that we endure trials, but it is just as true that we are delivered out of them. It is true that we have our corruptions, and mournfully do we know this, but it is quite as true that we have an all-sufficient Savior who overcomes these corruptions and delivers us from their dominion. In looking back, it would be wrong to deny that we have been in the slow of despond, and have crept along the valley of humiliation. But it would be equally wicked to forget that we have been through them safely and profitably. We have not remained in them, thanks to our almighty Helper and Leader, who has brought us out into a wealthy place. The deeper our troubles, the louder our thanks to God, who has led us through all and preserved us until now. Our griefs cannot mar the melody of our praise. We reckon them to be the base part of our life's song. He hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each morning at this same time for Morning and Evening. Greatest story ever told. Tonight we present Flight into Egypt, the fifth of five Christmas season dramas about the birth of that child who was to live the greatest life ever lived. The scene, the bustling city of Jerusalem, a city of secrets which the oppressed pass among themselves concerning the oppressor. But one bit of gossip passes freely this day among all the people and among their oppressors as well. And even now it has reached into the palace of cruel Herod, who stands looking down from his balcony. Your Majesty sees something below in the streets? Tell me what you said before. About the people? About those shepherds. Oh, that. Well, these shepherds were heard to be going about Bethlehem speaking about a child, a, a miraculous child. Some said they were drunk, but uh, others said they were inspired, uh, inspired in a holy way. And the child? What about the child? Well, the shepherds were saying that the child was born to become king of the Jews. Ah. Oh, surely you don't believe that any child born in Bethlehem of poor parents could ever grow to be king here. It happened to David, didn't it? He was a poor shepherd, wasn't he? He became a king. But those were other times, Herod. You can't allow yourself to be upset by every passing bit of gossip. Gossip runs rife at a time when great events are taking place. And this order to go and be counted for the Roman tax is such an event. Be quiet, Asa. 
Your Majesty is troubled. Hey, sir. Yes, Majesty. We must get to the bottom of this. I want spies sent to Bethlehem immediately. I want inquiries made. I want those shepherds brought here to me. I'll find out what all this talk about a king being born really means. But, Majesty, your position is secure. A king's position can never be secure. Do as I say. Dispatch men to Bethlehem at... Quickly. Open the door. It may be more news. Yes, Majesty. Well, come in. Come in. If you have work, come in. Majesty. Majesty, news. Important news. Well? Visiting dignitaries, and we've made no preparations to receive them. Who comes visiting me? I'm expecting no one. What are you talking about? What are you trying to do? Please, Majesty, I'm only telling you what happened. Well, tell it all. Quickly. Majesty, three men have come through the main gate of the city this morning. They're obviously important men, not mere travelers, but emissaries from another land. They're well-dressed, riding fine camels. And one camel is devoted to carrying fine gifts, beautifully wrapped. Gifts, eh? For me, no doubt. They've come seeking a favor. I don't think so. What do you mean, you don't think so? The way they talked. Our sentries followed them, just to be sure. Well? The three men didn't come to the palace. They went among the people, asking one question. And the question? Majesty, I only quote them. Speak up! They asked, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Hey. Majesty, please. Take your hands off me, sir. I'm all right. Three men come seeking the king of the Jews. There was more, Majesty. More? They said they'd seen his star in the east and came to worship him. This must be gossip. The captain of the guard heard it himself. Shall I bring him to you? Yes, at once. Now, wait. Majesty? Bring me the high priest of the temple first. Yes, Majesty. And as for the three men, I want them watched. What is it this time, Herod? Another order that will be painful to the people? You priests are always worrying. Well, this time I only want a little information about your religion, your folklore. They are not the same. Of course not. Badly phrased thought. About your religion, however, is there any prophecy about a king being born? A special kind of king for the Jews? There is a prophecy. Yes? My people have been promised the Messiah. Messiah? Tell me more. It's nothing you'd like to hear. I'm interested. Tell me more. The coming of the Messiah portends a new era in this world. Things will change. Governments will change. Even kings can't stand against it. This, uh, this prophecy, does it say where this king will be born? It could happen in only one place, in the town of Bethlehem, here in Judea. The prophecy says it must happen there. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Tell me, priest, do you believe the prophecy? Does it make any difference if I believe it? That's no answer. That's my answer. It's insolence. It's enough that you believe it, Herod. I didn't say I did. Then what is there to be so fearful about? Am I free to go now? Get out. Get out! Thank you, Majesty. Hey, sir! Hey, sir! Yes, yes, Majesty. Well, did he tell you? Is there a prophecy? Hey, sir, the three strangers. Bring them here. Maybe I can learn something from them. Bring them to me. What? To seize three foreign dignitaries? I don't care how you do it. Bring them here at once. Now, wait. Perhaps we can extract more from them by friendly means. We shall invite them to dine with me. That's it, eh, sir? The three strangers shall dine with me. And so you came from your native land to visit Judea. May I correct your majesty? 
We came not from one land, but from three lands, each from a different place in the east. Three lands? Oh. It's what made us even stronger in our determination to follow the star to our destination. Star? You follow a star? That's what makes us so sure. To each of us, in his own land, the star appeared at the same time some weeks ago. As it happens, we are all of us students of the heavens. Isn't that right? Yes, Majesty. We are. So each of us set out individually to follow this star which appeared so strangely in the skies. And it brought us together. So that together we came seeking the newborn king of the Jews. I see. Of course, Majesty, we are deeply grieved that we are here in your presence without suitable gifts. But we hadn't expected such a greeting from Herod himself. But they tell me, wise men, that you did come bringing some gifts. Those gifts for the newborn king. Those we couldn't disturb. Could it? Could it all be a fancy of some kind? The star, the newborn king, how do you know? We've asked ourselves that many times since we first met in our journey. And you've agreed on some answer? Surely men wise as you think. If, if there is any consolation in being wise, Majesty, it's that you know at some point knowledge must end. And where knowledge ends, their believing begins. I see. So you'll search till you find him? We must. We must worship him. We must lay our gifts before him. Surely I can do no less myself. I, for one, don't understand. Such a child born in my province. I should pay him honor, too. And I will. Wise men, do me a great favor. If we can, you can. It's a simple thing. When you find the child, come back to me. Let me know where he is, who his parents are. I, I want to worship him, too. Majesty, we'll do it on our way back. Good, good. This child shall receive such attention as was never paid to any child before. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ethan, no need to fear now. And no need to search for the child either. You, you've got news I hadn't heard, Majesty? No news, only cunning. The child will be found for me. The, the three men? <laughs> the three wise men, yes. Well, are you sure they know? I'm convinced of it. A star. They follow a star. Then maybe we should follow them. No. Don't upset anything. Don't make them suspicious. They'll bring the child to me, or me to the child. Either way, I'll make short shrift of this king. intrude so late at night. We must, Casper. This is the place, isn't it? We've been to all the other inns. It's this inn, no doubt. Who's there? No room, no room. We've come seeking a child here. Child? What is it with this child that so many come seeking him? You mean... There were others? Shepherds came a few nights ago, just as you. Did you hear, my friends? Others have sought him out, too. This is indeed the child. May we enter? I told you there's no room. We only want to see the child. Uh, then come in. It's this way. They're no longer in the stable. Come. This room here. Yes. Uh, who are these? The child. Everyone wants to see the child. Oh. 
Mind you, I want no more disturbances. And when these friends of yours depart, you'll bolt the door after them. I need my sleep. You three, you've come to see the child. Yes, friend. Who are you? My name is Joseph. A humble carpenter chosen for a duty I hope I'm worthy to fulfill. The child. The mother. In here, my friend. But softly, before he sleeps. Yes. Softly. The child. We must kneel, brothers. Mary. Mary, they worship him. Joseph. And the mother. We've sought you and the child a long time across desert waste and plains and mountains. We came seeking you. If I stare, my lady, forgive me for such a face as yours I've never seen before. And shall never see again. But the gifts, brothers. Yes, the gifts for the child, Joseph. We brought him gifts. I lay mine at his feet. Gold. Frankincense. Myrrh. Gifts. Mary, gifts for the child. Joseph. Joseph. Who calls? It's a voice I've heard before. Joseph. You. The angel. The angel. Why have you sought me out a second time? Have I failed? Joseph. Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I shall tell thee. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Destroy the child? No, no. We'll flee now in the dark of night. I've heard your word. And I will take the mother and child away from this place. And may the night be long and dark to cover our flight. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. Yes, Majesty. There must have been some word of those three. The wise men? Nothing yet, Majesty. I await reports every moment. But they said they would return. They, they did not return. And no trace of them? Is Bethlehem so big a place that my own sentry can't find them there? Well, they've escaped, I told you. Quiet. Yes, Majesty. Ah, Peckham. You found them. Well? Nothing, Majesty. They couldn't have disappeared off the face of the earth. They might as well have. Surely someone must have seen them in Bethlehem. No one last night, no one this morning. They may never have arrived in Bethlehem, for all we know. The priest said Bethlehem was the only place where the child could have been born. But no one saw the three old men. Majesty. Yes? Majesty, would the people ever cooperate with you? Would they tell you if they did see? You mean the three might have been there? Found the child and gone? Why not? And, and who would tell Herod Sentry? Yes. Yes. Yes, we shouldn't waste time with the three men. You're right. The child. The old men can do me no harm. But the child. The newborn king. Yes, Majesty. The king. 
He must die. He must be found first. He must die. But how can we? We must find him first. You may be able to kill him without finding him. Did you ever think of that, Asa? Majesty, please, we mustn't lose our heads. You think I'm insane. You think I don't know what I'm talking about, you wretch. No, no, (sighs) Majesty, of course not. But in one's excitement, one can say things. Can one? Well, I happen to know what I said and what I mean. Even if we never find out which child it is, he shall still die in this cradle. No, but but Majesty... You fool! Kill the one child I fear. I may have to kill them all. Majesty. Why do you stand there looking like that? Well, the, the people would complain to Rome. Let them. No, but, but such brutality. And what will Rome say? This herd is a man of power and principle. He killed his own son, didn't he? Well, didn't die? Uh, Majesty, please, others will hear. Let them hear. Do you think it was ever a secret? They talk about me behind my back. I am king and I have no secrets. But I'm strong, so I have no fear. Every child. Oh, but Majesty... The child is newborn. And what does newborn mean? A day, a week, a month, a year? I won't be cheated by technicalities. I order it now that every child, not just two years old, shall be considered newborn for the purpose of this action. Every child up to two years old... That, that's more than a few. I don't care if it's more than a great many. That's the order. You heard that, Ackham? Yes, Majesty. That's not all. We must be sure. I must be sure. What else is there to think of, Majesty? Isn't it enough? Wait, wait. Of course, the child was born in Bethlehem. Does that mean it must still be there? Perhaps they've moved the child. I'm moving it even now. Who would move a newborn child unless in great emergency? I told you I won't be defeated by any technicalities. The prophet said Bethlehem. But maybe the prophecy is elastic. After all, it was made hundreds of years ago. We must be sure. Bethlehem has been Bethlehem for hundreds of years. Till I will be sure. Asa is right, Majesty. Bethlehem is Bethlehem. Bring me a campaign map. There on the table. Yes, Majesty. Child. Child. How could it be? Majesty. Find me Bethlehem. Uh, here, Majesty. Quickly, something to make a mark. No, never mind. I'll do it this way. Oh, Majesty, you destroy the map. I know. There, Akab. This part of the map you take with you. It is Bethlehem and every town around it. Such it all. Just in case they try to escape me. Every child everywhere. In towns or farmhouses or on the roads. Wherever you find them. Hold out your hand. Yes, Majesty. I place this part of the map in your hand. Close your fist. Yes, Majesty. Now go. And don't return to me. Don't give back to me this piece of map until it becomes proof. Proof that every child up to two years of age in this whole area is dead. Whether found in a town, a field, or on the road. Yes, Majesty. How long can it take? Oh, please, Majesty, calm yourself. The order is being carried out. I know, I know. But I can't seem to rest till I hear it from Acker himself. Now, this is a day they won't forget. Don't worry about them. Majesty. Majesty. Well, Acker... Done, Majesty. Done. Ah, piece of map. Here, Majesty. Here. Good. Well done, Akab. <laughs> There'll be a reward for you. Akab. Akab, what is it? Speak! Your Majesty, he... Akab is not himself anymore. Take the feathering fall out of here. Job is done. I wonder, just where, just when, did that one child, that newborn king, die? It would be interesting to know that, eh, sir? And in any event, he's dead. Dead. 
And that's all that matters. Our people fled from Egypt. Now we flee there for safety. Over the same road to the same desert of Sinai. Even past the mount where the Ten Commandments were handed down. We follow the voice of the angel now, as we did before. All will be well for you, Mary. And for the child. Oh. Oh. Joseph. We must stop here for a moment, Mary. Our land. This is the last we shall see of it for a long time. Dark and peaceful seems the land of Israel now. But beneath the darkness, turmoil and strife and suffering. I don't like to leave Israel to its agony. But one day, Mary, the word of the angel shall come to us again. And then we shall return. We shall return, Mary, to Israel, land of our forefathers. And the child shall be with us. Next week on this same network at this time, we'll present Our Father, Which Art in Heaven. Another episode in the greatest story ever told from the greatest life ever lived. of God's inerrant, absolute, eternal, unbroken, verbally inspired word. The voice of truth is coming to you from the Metropolitan Tabernacle, 501 Opelousas Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana. This is Pastor Albert Pendora speaking, inviting you to stay tuned to hear God's message by our late pastor, L.R. Shelton Sr., on the subject, on this subject, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, miracles, prophecy, and discernment. That's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, miracles, prophecy, and discernment. And this is number 212 in this series. Now, before we take up the next gift, working of miracles, as set forth in that 10th verse, I want to call your attention to Paul's reason for writing to the church at Corinth, not only regarding spiritual matters, which is the literal meaning but to set in order practical matters which he deals with in the first 11 chapters. In, first, uh, in Corinthians 1.10, he goes right to the heart of the trouble when he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. The Corinthian church was split up into factions, which was a clear indication that they were not all walking after the Spirit. For he says in 1 Corinthians 14.33, God is not the author of confusion or disorder, 
but a peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let's now turn to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and read. Now concerning spiritual things, brethren, or gifts, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Now listen, friend, you listen. We you lay, lay down everything, listen. He had been writing to them about material things, such as eating of meats, sacrifice to idols, Christian liberty, marriage, going to law with one another, the Lord's Supper, and so on. And he turns now and directs their attention uh, entirely to spiritual matters. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual things. You remember that you were Gentiles and were carried away into idolatry, worshiping dumb idols that cannot speak. Consider this thing, brethren, that when the Lord called you out of idolatry, he delivered you from demon worship and demon possession, because back of every idol is a demon who led you as he willed. The very fact that they were converted from idolatry means that many of them probably got into the church who were not saved. Therefore, they were still demon-possessed. That is true of churches today. Before an individual is saved, he is motivated, energized, and controlled by the spirit of Satan. This is brought out so clearly in Ephesians 2.2. 2. Listen. Why, in in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Every individual out of Christ is a rebel, possessed by Satan, controlled by Satan, and by his demon spirits. That is what Paul meant when he reminded them, ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. There was an element in that church who had, been, who had made a profession of faith in Christ, but did not get saved. They were still demon-possessed and were being led by a demon spirit in their so-called Christian worship. It was this state of affairs that caused the division and disorder in the church, out of which grew, get it now, satanic manifestations in the imitation of the work of grace wrought in the hearts and lives of the born-again believers. Now, if you'll follow me in the next Sundays, I'll draw that line of distinction and show you here how Paul drew that line uh, of the distinction between Satan's imitation and the work of the Spirit in that church. Therefore, in setting forth the divine manifestations of a true work of grace and divine order of the church in its worship, the apostle laid down, first of all, now get it, hold it, the criterion by which to test and discern whether a person is saved or lost. Now, I want you to get this. The criterion by which to test and discern whether a person is saved or lost. He says very positively, listen, wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit or the Holy Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now you follow me, will you? The ecstasy which accompanied some of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit was readily confounded with the ravings of the false spirits and Satan's imitation of the gifts that the Lord bestowed upon the church was near in doctrinal statement, but contentious in spirit. Therefore the apostle first lays down the one test by which any individual may know whether the possessor of gifts spoke and moved by the power of the Holy Spirit or by the power of Satan. And that is based upon his confession that Jesus is Lord, which means that he bows to him as Lord, 
and confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Romans 10, 9, Philippians 2, 10, 11. It is not based upon feelings or aesthetic fractures or speaking with tongues or performing miracles. They signify nothing. Satan knows how to use them according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Listen, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan. Get it now, hold it. With all power and signs and lying wonders. So Paul draws the line here and arrays the unsaved individual against the saved one and says, the unsaved individual speaks of Jesus anathema, accursed. And the saved individual speaks of him, Jesus, Lord. Paul is saying, now you listen, every unsaved individual in that Corinthian church will speak of the Lord Jesus Christ only as Jesus. Let me repeat that. Now you listen. Every unsaved individual, Paul said, in that Corinthian church will speak of the Lord Jesus Christ only as Jesus. They cannot call him Lord. They will not call him Lord because he is not their Lord. They may speak in tongues. If they do, that is demonism. They may perform miracles. If they do, that is magic or the work of the demons. But the individual who is saved will call Jesus Lord by the Holy Spirit because he recognizes him as his Lord. He believes in him as his Lord. He calls upon him as his Lord. He proclaims him as Lord. And he glorifies his name by a true confession of faith, by a holy obedience, and a subjection to his will. Because this now, now you get this, because this is a special gift of the Holy Spirit. No man can call Jesus Lord but by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now this is Paul's introduction to his discussion of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in his work in the assembly. Let me say this, that to call Jesus Lord is a special gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is required of every believer. This cannot be lip service, but it must be a calling upon the Lord or a confession of the Lord from the heart. To say that Jesus is Lord is to acknowledge oneself his servant and to seek only his honor. This is done by all true Christians because all true Christians have the Holy Spirit. And whatever their gifts may be, Christ is to be recognized and honored as Lord. The thing that has happened to our churches today is that so many of the members do not know the Lord. Christ is not their Lord. They are demon-possessed, motivated, energized by Satan. Therefore, all types of heresies have crept in and still are like a flood into our churches, including the ministry and on out. And the Lord Jesus Christ is not recognized. Many are teaching today that Christ is the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is Christ. Therefore, they have no redeemer, no substitute. The Holy Spirit didn't die for sinners. Christ died for sinners. The Holy Spirit was not incarnated. The Lord Jesus Christ was incarnated. And as a substitute, he went to the cross and died in our place, paying our sin debt in full. Now you hold this. When you deny the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you have no redeemer. And when you deny the Lordship of Christ, you have no substitute. Because the scriptures plainly says in Acts 2.36, God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, my friends, I'll stick my eternal destiny on those statements being true. Paul writes to the church at Philippi and plainly states again, Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. The lost doctrine today in our churches is the Lordship of Christ. 
And that's the reason our ministers and others are being led by these demon spirits. They have nothing real. And Satan has given them reality in this day of call into religious worship. It is not the reality of Christ. It's the reality of, it is not the reality of salvation. It is the reality of an imitation produced by demon spirits in the name of a Jesus the Bible does not know. Now let us look at verse 4 to 6 of 1 Corinthians 12. And we find three expressions that I want you to notice particularly. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Literally, this means diversities of grace bestowed upon individuals by the Holy Spirit who know Christ as Lord. We have discussed some of them, and we'll come to the others later. Notice second, there are diversities of operations in that fifth verse, or administrations, but the same Lord. Operations means services. Let me call your attention to this difference. The Holy Spirit gives gifts for service. That is to individual believers. But the Lord Jesus Christ gave gifted men to the churches for service. It is always the same Lord, and is always the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are never two men who have the same office, and no two men are equipped by the Lord in the same way for service. Father, no two men accomplish the same work in the same manner, but the Lord Jesus Christ is their Lord. Another thing, this means that there is no hierarchy in the church, but all ministers on the same equality. You won't find generals and lieutenants and privates in God's army. We find the third expression in verse 6. And there were diversities, diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Literally, there are diversities of workings or activities, but it's the same God who worketh all in all. Now listen, in these verses, Paul is showing us clearly the unity of the Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, work in unity. Therefore, the church that is led by the Holy Spirit will work in unity with each other if they, if they are each led by the same Spirit. Notice that he says there are diversities of gifts, but get this truth, the same Holy Spirit. The Spirit is not spoken of here as mere force, but as a personality, the third person of the triune God, having attributes and works ascribed to him. Then he says, the same Lord. There are diversities of services, but the same Lord overall. The name Lord describes him as the divine sovereign of the world, sitting at the right hand of God, to whom is given the possession of the world. The diversities of administrations or services or ministries are ascribed to him by preeminence, because ministers are ministers or ambassadors of Christ, and the mediatorial office of Christ is prophet, priest, and king is exercised through his ministers. Then he says, the same God. We find that through the workings of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ is brought to men, and then men are brought through the Lord Jesus Christ to God our Father. Thus we are brought through the Spirit to the Son, through the Son to the Father. Therefore, all of God is ours. All adversities, uh, diversities of gifts and administrations and workings proceed from the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, brother, there, there, there's where so much division hangs. Let's not get away from this great truth. In regard to the work of the triune God in the churches, we have God the Father, the operator of all spiritual influences in all. We have God the Son, the ordained in his churches of all ministries or services by which that influence may be legitimately brought out for edification. Then God the Holy Spirit dwelling and working in the church makes effective in each member such measure of his gifts as he sees fit. As we look at our Bible as a whole, listen. We see the Holy Trinity 
from beginning to end. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit solemnly met at the creation of the world, culminating in the creation of man when he said, Let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our own image. Then in time we see the Trinity meeting the second time at the baptism of Christ. When the Holy Spirit came and rested upon Christ in the form of a dove, and the Father spake from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then here the third time we see the Trinity meeting at the baptism of the church with the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit was visible, he sat down and took up his abode in the hearts of many women, whom he had made in the likeness of Christ, and divided gifts severally or individual to the born again believers as he willed. You see that, brethren, in that grace, at the creation, at the baptism of Christ, and at the baptism of the church, the Holy Trinity met. As we turn now to the Father at the gifts of the Spirit, let us keep in mind that the entire letter to the Corinthian church was written to make clear the difference between the worship of idols, which is the demon spirit, demon worship, and the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, where in the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are set forth in perfect relationship of unity in the midst of the church as a whole and believers individually. <clears throat> I, I wish you'd order this message and study it. In verse 10 we find these words, to another, the working of miracles, operations of works of power. The working of miracles refers primarily to those operations of works of power, because healing, besides healings, let me call your attention again to the dual, uh, double plural, operations of works of power, which means effects that are miraculous, or which can be answered only in the light of the power of God. The church walking in the will of God, under the power of the Holy Spirit, will witness marvelous works of grace, operations of power that will astound the world. Such statements seem strange to the present day cold Orthodox Church, which has rejected the Holy Spirit and is working in the image of the flesh. The church, because of unbelief, no longer expects to see great manifestations of power of the Holy Spirit in hearts and lives of sinners in casting out demons and seeing the vilest of sinners transformed in the likeness of the Son of God of things brought to pass that only be wrought by the Holy Spirit, which is far beyond all human power. One of the greatest miracles I've ever seen is God taking a poor old hell-deserving sinner and making him a new creation or creating a new being. In other words, the new birth is the greatest miracle of the Holy Spirit. When we speak of miracles, or operations and works of power. We have in mind the opening of the eyes of the blind, unstopping the ears of the deaf, raising the dead, and such like. As the Word of God was written and given to the church, we find that such miracles begin to diminish. Miracles of that type were given largely as a proof or sign of the power of God. But since the Word has been written and given us, there is no need for such signs now. Christ said on one occasion, that if they'll not believe Moses and the prophets, the scriptures, they'll not believe one raised from the dead. Miracles were never given to lead men to Christ. The only thing will open men's hearts to see their need of Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Now, let's come to the sixth gift, which is prophecy. Verse 10 says to another prophecy. The word prophecy has two meanings. First, it means to foretell things that are going to happen. And second, it's, that is, it's pre-written history. Second, it means to foretell the things of Christ. The New Testament prophet was a foreteller, one whose gift enabled him or her to speak for the edification and exhortation and comforts of others, as set forth in 1 Corinthians 14.3. 
For he that prophesied speaketh unto men, unto edification and exhortation and for comfort. The emphasis on prophecy here is that of witnessing or telling what Christ has done for you. When the Holy Spirit takes hold of an individual, he leads the individual to witness for Christ. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Brethren, he said, Paul said here in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, that prophecy is one of the outstanding gifts. He says, Brethren, covet to prophesy. Again in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow out love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. Acts 12, 31. Uh, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. This shows plainly that Paul puts the emphasis on prophecy as the greatest of all gifts. I do not know of any things more refreshing than to hear someone tell what Christ means to him, how the Holy Spirit brought him down the way of grace, not tell about experiences or visions or dreams or talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, but to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my friends, we need more of that today. Pray for that gift, will you? Then the next gift mentioned here in verse 10 is, to another the, the discerning of spirits. As prophecy, get this now, means the announcement of things hidden by means of a divine revelation or inspiration or the Holy Spirit illuminating the Word of God and at the same time opening our minds to the spiritual vision of Christ and to the things hidden in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit wants us to know about Christ and His kingdom and the mysteries of the inner life as well as the outward life in Christ. Now that's prophecy. So the discerning of spirits is placed by the side of this enlightening, awakening, and invigorating operation of the Holy Spirit as a judicial and critical power. This is the ability to distinguish between, between true prophecy and false prophecy, or ability to see whether the individual is talking about knowing Christ experimentally or is just making a profession of faith in Christ. Most of the time, folks think you're judging when you stand there and analyze an individual's heart and mind and show him that he's false, that his profession is false, that he's a demon-possessed and does not know anything about Christ as Lord experimentally. Only by the gift of discernment can you tell the difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of Satan or see the difference between just the excitement of the natural man and discern that he has the spirit of Satan and not the spirit of Christ. We are exhorted to try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. I've often said, let me talk with a person five minutes, and I can generally tell you whether he's saved or lost. That does not mean that I have great wisdom or knowledge. It means that the Lord has given me the spirit of discernment. And if I can get you to talk with me, your language will betray you. I made a statement out of the kit one night to that effect, and at the close of the service, a deacon came up to me and said, Brother Sheldon, I'm going to take you at your word. Now, talk to me five minutes. I'll talk to you five minutes. Then you tell me whether I'm saved or lost. He made a statement or two. As I started to open my mouth, he said, You don't need to say anything, Brother Sheldon. I don't know Christ, and you know I don't. I said, That's right. Your language betrays you. Every born-again believer has a language peculiar to a believer, and no one else can imitate it. I don't care how much you try to camouflage it or how much you try to imitate it. You cannot imitate the language of an individual who knows the Lord experimentally if you're not saved. You may go so far as all but deceive the elect, what the elect can tell it. 
Let me sit it. Let me sit in an audience and listen to a preacher for a few minutes, and I can tell you whether he's saved or lost, because his language betrays him. We used to have a young man preach for us in French over the radio. One day, a real Frenchman met me and said, Pastor, that man preaching over the radio isn't a Frenchman. I said, how do you know? He says his language betrays him. He can, we can understand him. He knows French, but he can't talk it like a Frenchman. And I don't care how much you may imitate the believer's language. I'm saying, individual, you cannot talk the language of a believer. This brings to the close another broadcast of The Voice of Truth. We want to thank you for your letters and gifts that keep these messages going out, for your prayers, those of you who write us and call us and tell us you're praying for us, those of you who support this work, getting out the gospel, we thank you for that. We ask the Lord for you day after day. The title of the message today was The Gifts of the Holy Spirit, Miracles, Prophecy, and Discernment by a late pastor, L.R. Shelton Sr. This is number 212 in this series, and you may have a free printed copy simply by requesting it. All of these messages preached by Pastor Shelton on this broadcast are available on cassette tape for $3 each, and this includes the full 60 minutes with the radio choir singing, the letters by Mrs. Wileen, and then the message. And I'd like to mention in closing that we appreciate your standing with us at this time. We're always happy to hear from you. Let us know that you're interested in getting out the gospel, helping us with these radio broadcasts as they go out, letting us know if the blessed messages are blessing your heart. Sit down and write us. Give us the call letters of the station that you're hearing us over. We may not have anybody listening. We'll call, cancel that station, and put the broadcast somewhere else. If you would, sit down and tell us. Pastor, don't, don't cut the station. We want to hear. Would you do that? Our mailing address is Radio Missions, Post Office Box 6250, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70174. It's always good to hear from you. Help us with the Bible phone, if you will, and write us, and we'll be glad to send you a catalog of our Radio Bible and Book Room. We have a new one coming out before long. Also, we may making the new uh, radio choir tape, number four. Be ready for delivery in the next few weeks. So you write us and let us know. We'll be glad to send it to you. And it's always good to hear from you. Let us know that you're praying for us. Remember, my mailing address is Radio Missions, Post Office Box 6250, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70174. May the Lord's richest blessings rest upon you. This is Pastor Albert Pendarvis saying, this is the Voice of Truth broadcast. It was announced in the press that the title of my message this evening was LSD. To those of an older generation, LSD stood for pounds, shillings, and pence. But to modern youth, LSD is the name of a dangerous, death-inflicting, and damning drug. The world, of course, has gone crazy, and escapism from the circumstances that surround modern youth is imperative to their living. And so modern youth and older folks, too, caught up in this hazy, crazy, sinning, licentious, and adulterous age, they go for what they call LSD trips. And they take this drug, and they go on a trip of fantasy. They forget about their circumstances. They forget about their environment. They forget about the battles that men and women have got to face as they face up legitimately to life's struggles, to life's sorrows, to life's temptations, and to life's hardship. There are thousands of young people who have fallen a prey to this drug addiction. What is the antidote to LSD? Having a coffee party on a Sunday night? 
giving the youth as much of the pleasures of the world that they want on church premises after the Lord's Day service. The only answer to every sin and to every pleasure of this world is the answer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am sold out completely on this fact that Jesus Christ alone can meet the need of the human heart. And there's not a person in this meeting, I don't care what your addiction may be, what your pleasure may be, what your habit may be, what your circumstances may be, what your environment may be, what your past may be, Jesus Christ can completely satisfy you. I have been thinking on those letters LSD, and I find that the gospel antidote to LSD is LSD. And I want to take four of the LSDs of the gospel. The gospel, first of all, proclaims a long-suffering deity. That's the first one. A long-suffering deity. Turn with me to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. A long-suffering deity. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as a man counts slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A long Suffering deity. My dear sinner, in this meeting tonight, you are a living monument. You are a living testimony. You are an everyday testimony to the fact that God is long-suffering. He is long-suffering, for He has restrained you in sin's follies. There were sins that the devil wanted you to commit. But by the grace of God, sinner, although you're still in your sins, you didn't commit them. God was good to you. There were things that you planned to do, and roads that you planned to travel, and paths that you planned to walk along. But God, in His great mercy, restrained you in your sins. You remember the man that purposed to do sin in the Old Testament? And his testimony was this, God withheld me from sin. You say, preacher, do you believe that God restrains unregenerate men in their sin? I do. I believe that that drunkard would have finished in a drunkard's grave, but God restrained him, preserved him when his feet be it his to hell. That's what God has been doing with you. He has been long-suffering to you. He's restrained you from doing sins, my friend, that would have darkened your soul with the blackness of hell's midnight forever. He has restrained you in the path of sin's folly. Why? Because he's long-suffering. I'll tell you what else he has done. He has retained you in life and He has preserved you to this day. We live in a world of accidents. We live in a world of sickness. We live in a world of tragedy. And you know yourself there are vacant seats in your family circle. You know yourself there are vacant places among the associates in business and in the particular environment in which you move. But you're in the meeting tonight, sinner, because God has retained you in time. That accident that you were in, you could have been cut off. That tragedy that overtook your friends, it could have overtaken you. That life-ending sickness that cut down your nearest and your dearest, it could have cut you down. But God was long-suffering. He was long-suffering. I want to say not only has God been long suffering in restraining you in sin's folly, in retaining you in time and preserving your life, 
but he's long-suffering and renewing another offer of the gospel to you. You know what's happening to you? You're hearing the gospel tonight another time. God's good to you, isn't it? Yes, last Sunday night, the Spirit of God spoke to you, young man. The Spirit of God, young woman, laid hold upon you. And you hardened your night, didn't you? And you went out resisting, refusing, rejecting. But you're back tonight. And the gospel is being renewed to you once again. Why? Because God is long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Renewing the offer of the gospel. And then, friend, God is long-suffering. For he's reframing from his swift and terrible judgment upon your soul. You don't deserve, my friend, to be where you are. It's only the mercy of God that keeps being merciful to you. The Bible says, because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with a stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. The word of God says, he that being often reproved and hardened this night shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. The immutable, unchangeable law of God says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But you're still in time. God has reframed from loosing upon you his swift and terrible judgment. The gospel, my friend, proclaims a long-suffering deity. God has been long-suffering. The Holy Spirit has striven with you when you were young. He's striven with you when you were a young man or a young woman. He has striven with you in middle age. And some of you are old. And you're going down. And every day he's taking you nearer to death. To the coffin. To the Christless grave. To the Christless tomb. To the Christless shroud. To the Christless hell. But he's been long suffering. He will have mercy on you even tonight if you'll call upon his name. I'm glad God doesn't cut men off in their sin. I'm glad he's gracious. I'm glad he's loving. I'm glad he's kind. I'm glad that he lets a man go a very long way before he cuts him off in his wrath. The gospel of Jesus Christ proclaims a long-suffering deity. The gospel of Jesus Christ points to a loving Savior's death. That's the second thing in the gospel. The hand of the gospel is always pointing to the death of Jesus. Turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 53. And in that chapter we have a wonderful description of the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And thou shalt make his soul An offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Three things about Christ's death. It's origination. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Here is man fallen, lost, ruined, hell-bent, and hell-deserving. Sin must be punished. Death must overcome and overtake the lawbreaker. What's going to happen? The whole world of sinners to be damned have fallen men like fallen angels. No way back into the presence of God. And then God steps in. And the Father makes His Son your substitute and my substitute. Your surety and my surety. Your sacrifice and my sacrifice. And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was the will of God that he should wear the crown of thorns. It was the Father's will that he should be buffeted and spat upon. It was the Father's will that he should give us back to the smiter and his cheek to those that plucked off the hairs. It was the Father's will that he should hang stark naked on the cross. 
But my friend, I can describe the whipping and the scourging and the bleeding and the crucifying and the crowning and the buffeting and the battering of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's one thing I can't describe. The darkness. And Jesus Christ went out into the darkness. And God put out the heaven's light and made the sun to withhold its shining. And when God bruised Jesus for me, I'll never be able to understand that. Jehovah drew his awful rod. O Christ, it fell on thee. Thou wast sore stricken of my God, didst bear all ills for me. A victim led, thy blood was shed. Now blessings draft for me. The origination of Christ's death that pleased the Lord to prove. Look at this, the propitiation of Christ's death. What did he propitiate? Our sins when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Jesus Christ was made an offering for sin. I deserved eternal hell. Down in hell, there are thirsty souls among the damned. Every damned soul is crying for a drop of water. Jesus Christ took the dread cup of my hell in his hand and he drank it to the dregs. And he cried, I thirst! Why? Because he's enduring the pangs of hell for me. That's why. Jesus Christ cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God forsaken on the cross. Hell is a place where men are eternally forsaken by God forever. Don't you see it, friend? With one tremendous draught, he drank for me, damnation dry. That's what the cross means. That's its propitiation. But thank God it has a consummation. He shall see a seat. What does that mean? That means that he saved that drunkard and made him clean through his precious blood. That means that he has saved that gambler, that he saved that sinner, that unclean person, that poor fallen woman of the street, that religious Pharisee and hypocrite, that person that thought that the church could take them to heaven and found out like Nicodemus that they needed to be born again. Jesus Christ, through the cross, sees his seat. Not yonder in heaven, that on the crystal sea of glass, before the everlasting throne there is an innumerable company which no man can number. And everyone has a white robe, and everyone has a golden heart, and everyone is playing the sweetest celestial music that human fingers could bring from that heart that's strung with gold. What are they praising God for? Because Jesus died for them. That's what they're praising God for. He shall see a seat. He shall prolong his day. Thank God Jesus Christ is the living Christ. He died once. He lives forever. Sinner, I'm not asking you to put your name at a dead creed tonight. I'm not asking you to sign a formula tonight. I'm not asking you to consent to a long list of doctrines that you don't understand. I want to introduce you to a living Blessed, life-giving friend, Jesus Christ. Oh, that you might meet him. Oh, that you might know him. Oh, that you might trust him. Oh, that you might love him. Oh, that you might keep company with him. He breaks every fetter. He smashes every chain. He loses from every habit. He sets man and woman free. And he can set you free tonight. His blood can make ten thousands clean. His blood avails for me. Oh, that tonight you might know him. That's the death of Christ. A loving Savior's death. But the gospel not only portrays a long-suffering deity and points to a loving Savior's death, but the gospel proposes a lost sinner's deliverance. Yeah. 
lost sinners can be delivered tonight. The sweetest, the shortest, the simplest verse in the Bible to me is Romans 10 and 13. What a verse it is. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The lost sinner's deliverance. There's four things in that verse, Frank. There's the widest possible scope. Whosoever. The widest possible scope. Whosoever. That brings you in, Frank. You're sitting here tonight and you're saying, Preacher, I would get saved, but I couldn't keep it. You know who told you that? The devil. Who told you? No man keeps salvation. But Jesus keeps all those committed to it. That's the devil's lie, you know. He wants to take it to hell. Will you go to hell believing the devil's lie tonight? Whosoever you say, preacher, it's not me. It's for my mates. It's for my friends. But me, I could never keep it. God's saying tonight, whosoever. That's the widest possible scope. Takes in everybody in this meeting. You say, preacher, do you believe that God could save everybody in this meeting? I believe He could save them in a thousand times more. It's the gospel I believe. Let me tell you something else. In this verse, you not only have the widest possible scope, but you have the simplest possible act. Call. The word in the original is cry. It's easy to cry. Not a man or woman here. Boy or girl, you can't cry. How do a man get saved? By the simplest possible act. It's not baptism, or the Lord's Supper, or the church you're praying, or Bible reading, or believing a set of doctrines. It's crying. That's how matters are. By crying. The widest possible scope, whosoever, teaching everybody. The simplest possible act. Cry. In God's name, sinner, cry tonight, and God will save you. That's all you've got to do. We have something else in this verse. We have the highest, the grandest possible name. What name is that? The name of the church? No, sir. The name of the preacher? No, sir. The name of doctrines? No, sir. The name of a well-established scriptural creed? No, sir. What is it? It's the name of Jesus. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Wonderful name of Jesus. I'm thinking at this moment of people that I have whispered that name to. I was preaching in a tent in a certain place. And one night when I made the appeal, I heard a great sob. It wasn't the sob of a child or the high-pitched sob of a woman. It was the deep, awful sob of a man in distress. And when I made the appeal, he stepped forward made a little curtain in front of the tent, and I drew it aside. And he stepped in, and I shut him in. When the others had gone, he just sat there sobbing. And he said, Mr. Paisley, I have committed a terrible sin. And he said, last week you preached in this tent. And he says, I've been in hell ever since. He says, I'm sobbing now, but I have sobbed since last Sunday behind the hedges of my farm. I have gone out and left my bed, and I have laid down in the gutter, and I have sobbed. He says, my God, I have wrecked myself, I have wrecked my family, I have wrecked my name. And he shook like a sally rod shaken by the wind. He said, Mr. Paisley, is there hope for a villain like me, a criminal like me, a sinner like me? He said, I not only sinned, but like David, I covered up my sin. And no one would know, but he said, you put your finger on it. I never knew the man, never saw him before. He said, you uncovered it. And my God, he says, it's awful. I said to that man, I said, there are certain things about your sin that are public. And public sins must be repented of publicly. Private sins should be repented of privately. He said, Mr. Paisley, I'll do all I can to put it right. But he said, even if I do that, that will not help me. I said, no, it will not. But I said, there's a name that will help you. It's the name of Jesus. You know what it did to that man? It soothed his sorrow. It healed his wounds. It drove away his tears. I was in a meeting in that district some time ago, and there was him and his wife and his family, and he was singing the songs of Zion with all his heart. 
He had put everything right. It was a hard battle, but he did it. And I said to him, how about it? He said to me, it's just Jesus who's done it. He's done it for me. The Lord Jesus, friend, is whom you need to call on. The grandest possible name. And then there's something else. The greatest possible fight. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord might be saved. It doesn't say that. Whosoever shall call on the Lord in the name of the Lord can be seen. It doesn't say that. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord probably will be seen. No, sir. It says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be seen. And it's done. And it's done eternally. And I want to tell you, friend, God stakes his character upon his own word. I'm going to heaven on the word of Jesus Christ. God's character is at stake. Some of you people who believe in me, you would come forward, and if I said to you a thing, you would believe me. But, friend, I'm only a poor, faltering, sinning, and perfect human being. But listen, friend, you can trust the Word of God tonight. Oh, that you might trust Him. Oh, is there some man here torn with strife? Is there some heart that's sore? Is there some soul that's darkened? Is there somebody here with a burden? Jesus lifts the burden! Don't carry it anymore. Put it in the sepulcher like old John Bunyan's pilgrim, and you'll see it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. The greatest possible fact, you'll be saved. You say, preacher, what about tomorrow? You come back here next week, friend, and look up Romans 10 and 13, and it'll still be the same. You come back here in a fortnight and look it up, it'll still be the same. Come back in 50 years, it'll still be the same. Friend, turn up the Word of God when the heavens are no more and the stars are forgotten and the earth's planet is forgotten and the Word of God stands forever. Still be the same. No change, Jehovah knows. I've often told the story. Tell it again tonight. It's worth repeating of the man, of the little boy and his mother who came to Christ in Major Whittle's meeting. Major Whittle was a contemporary of D.L. Moody. And they came on the verse, John 6 and 37, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast up. They went home, got up in the morning. Little boy got his breakfast, went off whistling to school. Mommy started to do her work. And the devil came and said, You're not saved. So does doubt. And instead of the woman trusting in the word, she started to doubt and fear and look in. She lost assurance. She didn't lose salvation. She lost assurance of salvation. When she came home, she went, the little boy came home for his lunch. Mommy was weeping. She says, Johnny, I'm not saved. Johnny was a very wise little boy. He went to the cupboard, got the old Bible down, turned it to John 6 and 37. Then he started to laugh. He says, Mommy, it's still in the book. It's still in the book. Someone said to W.P. Nicholson, what have you got for salvation but a bit of paper with writing on it? Correct, says Nicholson, but it's God's writing that's on the bit of paper. God's writing. I've got God's writing for my salvation. That'll do me. It'll do you. It'll do every man that'll come. One last word, friend. The gospel portrays life's sure destiny. What is life's sure destiny? I can tell you tonight. Every man and every woman in this meeting is on a trip of no return. You're taking a trip tonight. It's a trip of no return. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in their act. It is appointed unto man once to die. You're all dying men and women. I'm nearer to preaching my last sermon than ever I've been before. You're nearer to listening to your last sermon than ever you've been before. We're all dying, and we're all going to the judgment. Friend, if you died tonight and appeared at the judgment bar, how would it be with your soul? Now answer it honestly. Answer it honestly tonight. How would it be with your soul? Would it be a Christless soul? A Christless deathbed? A Christless shroud? A Christless coffin? A Christless judgment? And a Christless hell forever. Alas, alas, scores and scores of men and women in this very meeting tonight. And if death came and judgment came, their destiny would be hell, eternal hell, forever.
evermore. I have one appeal to make to you tonight, friend. Don't listen to the devil's lies. Don't listen to the devil's arguments. But this night come, get the gospel antidote for every ill, for every sickness, for every habit. Take Jesus as your Savior and walk out of this meeting in the company of a friend that will never leave you. A friend that will be with you in time, with you in death, with you for all eternity. In God's name, sinner, be saved tonight. Francesco Forgione was born on the 25th of May, 1887, in southern Italy. His parents, peasants, were extremely poor, but the father, realizing the religious nature of his son, came to New York and worked as a day laborer to obtain the money for Francesco's education. In 1902, Francesco began his novitiate at the Capuchin Monastery at Morcone, taking the name of Pio. On August 10, 1910, he was ordained and was assigned to San Giovanni Rotondo Monastery near Foggia. And there he settled down to a life of obscurity and prayer. It was on a Friday, September 20th, 1918, three days after the Capuchin Fathers had celebrated the Feast of the Stigmata of St. Francis. And all was quiet as the Fathers went about their duties. Someone is hurt. There's been an accident. It came from the choir stall, the one at the end. It's Padre Pio. He's unconscious. Here, help me. Stretch him out on the floor. Gently now. Gently. Reverend Father, look. His hand. They're bleeding. Help me to get him to his cell and say nothing about what's happened to anyone. Understand? No one. Yes, Reverend Father. Get his clothes off and cover 
him well. His stockings, look, they're soaked from the wounds on his feet. His tunic also. The stigmata of St. Francis. The wounds of Christ. I, I think he's regaining consciousness. Look, he's opening his eyes. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Padre Pio. Padre Pio. Reverend Father. How did I, how did I get here? I, I was in the choir stall, making my prayer of thanksgiving when, when... Yes, yes. Can you tell us what happened? I remember I was finishing my prayer when I suddenly felt terrible pain, as if my body were on fire. I cried out, at least I thought I did. At least, well, that is all I remember. I, I must have fainted. Reverend Father, my hands, my hands, they're bleeding. I have terrible pain in my feet and my left side. My son, the five wounds of Christ have appeared on your body. The stigma? Oh, no. No, it cannot be. Look at the back and the palm of your hand. Do the others know? Only Padre Leone and I so far. This must be kept a secret. It will not go beyond the monastery. Everyone will be put under strict orders of silence. If this, if this miracle goes beyond these walls, we'll be stormed by people. I know that only too well. However, what has happened must be reported to the Vatican for the record and for instructions. In the meantime, Padre Pio... Remain in your cell. Reverend Father, I have come because of this most glorious, this most wonderful news. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Come, Reverend Father, I can understand your reluctance to broadcast it, but as mayor of the village, you do not need to be tight-mouthed with me. Would you please tell me what news you're talking about? This miracle that has happened to one of your priests. And where did you hear this bit of news? It is all over the village. It, it is all people talk about. They say San Giovanni Rotondo is harboring a saint, a priest blessed with the five wounds of Christ. A group was ready to march up the hill, but I asserted my authority and said I would call and investigate. My dear sir, go back to the village and tell your people only the church can proclaim a saint. And only after long and careful examination, and usually long after a person is dead. You deny a priest when Padre Pio has been blessed with the stigmata of Christ? An event of unusual nature has taken place. But it's much too early to evaluate its significance. I had hoped it could have remained a secret until a thorough investigation could be made. You have no right to hide a miracle from the people. Will you please stop using the term miracle? Call it what you will. You cannot expect it to remain a secret. You have made that abundantly clear, Mayor. One could say such secrets are not meant to be kept. Your visit has forced me to make a statement I would have liked to have postponed. To head off fanciful and fantastic rumors, I must tell you exactly what happened. And I ask you to correct any misstatements you might hear. You can rely on me, Reverend Father. On the 20th of September, Padre Pio was at prayer when suddenly he felt intense pain from which he fainted. When we took him to his cell, we found the stigmata upon him. And does this not prove he's a saint? It does not. The church is distrustful of such outward manifestations, which are often found to be the results of hysteria, or autosuggestion, or some other neurosis. These marks could disappear as suddenly as they came. What's that? They could disappear, or be erased by medical treatment, which Padre Pio was using. But they haven't, have they? No. And it is now six weeks since they appeared. That is correct. He bleeds? Yes. Reverend Father, may I be permitted to visit Padre Pio? That is impossible. But as mayor, as the representative of the people... Padre Pio will have no pastoral duties or see anyone until the restrictions imposed by the Vatican are lifted. When will that be? I cannot say. 
But this is important to me, to others of the village. We have a great opportunity to develop this little village into a place of importance, a shrine, such as, as Lourdes, with hotel shops. Only this morning I took an option on a site suitable for a hotel for 200 rooms. The news of this miracle, I mean, this unusual happening, will become known all over the world, and people will flock to San Giovanni. But not if he's locked in a cell and forbidden to see anyone. I understand your concern, Signor. You must petition the Pope to lift the ban. So people may come and stare at his wounds, as if he were a freak in a circus? And there will be a waiting line at your 200-room hotel? You have confirmed this stigma. What more do you want? I don't understand. Senor, how profitable would your investment in real estate be if the doctors were able to stop the flow of blood in a week or so? Do you think they can? Have they said so? If you are asking me whether you should exercise your option, I am not in the real estate business. Good day, senor. <laughs> What is that shouting all about? People are at the door and refuse to leave. Some of them have brought food and blankets. People clamor to see you, Padre Pio. Did you tell them Padre Pio couldn't be seen? Yes. And a man handed me this newspaper. Oh? Stigmatist at San Giovanni. Vatican refuses to confirm or deny a report, but this reporter has learned from a very reliable source that Padre Pio, a 31-year-old priest... Still bleeds from the five wounds which appeared three months ago. Would you see who that is, please? Come in, doctor. I am also the mailman this morning. Padre Bruno asked me to save him with three. Oh, that mail. It's addressed to you, Padre Pio. Shall I open the letters for you? Please, Father Leone. Let us see the hands, Padre. Have you been putting anything on the wounds? I put iodine in an effort to hold the flow of blood. I would stop that. Since my last visit, I have consulted many specialists. They all throw up their hands. There is no scientific explanation for stigmata, so they are at a loss for a cure. This letter is from a woman who has sinned, and she asks Padre to pray for her. Right, I shall pray for her, and... Not to despair, for the doors of paradise are open to every human creature. And here is a letter of gratitude. A woman's baby of six months suffered from toxemia. Injections were given without effect. The mother prayed and invoked your name, Padre. And three days later, she writes, the child had recovered. It was a God who cured her baby. Reverend Father, I understand the position of the church. But I see no point in submitting Padre Pio to endless examinations to satisfy the skeptical and the detractors. Stigmata will be always a matter of controversy. Doctor, what is your opinion? Or would you prefer I didn't ask? I am a doctor, and I have always been suspicious of stigmata. But Father Pio has disturbed me very much. Many people will ask me the same question. How shall I answer them, Padre Pio? Truthfully. In that case, I will have to say that since I know of no natural cause for the wounds, I must regard their origin as supernatural. It has been hard for you to say this. Yes. But now that I have, I will no longer hesitate to say so in the presence of my colleagues. for you. His Holiness has lifted the ban against your appearing in public. Someone has interceded for me. Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it was Don Norioni. And I must say, under circumstances very hard to believe, 
He claims he saw you in the Basilica of St. Peter yesterday. Of course, his holiness knows you never leave San Giovanni. But because others claim to have seen you in Rome at various times, he called Don Orione in and questioned him. Don Orione confirmed he had seen you and suggested the Pope lift the ban. Don Orione couldn't have seen you. What do you make of it? Don Orione is noted for sanctity. Yes, of course. But surely you, you, you didn't go to... Well, let me put it this way. When God sent St. Anthony to another place by means of bilocation, was St. Anthony aware of it? I am certain he was. One moment he is in his cell, and the next, where God wants him to be. But is he really in two places at once? Yes. How is it possible? It is quite simple. By a prolongation of his personality. Prolongation of... Oh, yes, yes, of course. But to get back to the Pope, you are to be permitted to hear confessions and to celebrate the Mass. You will not preach, and all your activities will be confined to the monastery. When may I begin? Any time you wish. Then, tell those who have come to see me. I will hear confessions tomorrow, the women in the morning, the men in the afternoon. Mass will be at five for those who wish to attend. Padre, what are you doing to those gloves? I'm cutting off part of the fingers. But why? Why? I want my hands covered, but my fingers free. So I'll wear these fingerless gloves at all times, except when celebrating the Mass. Very good idea. Here's the mail. Reverend Father, it gets heavier each day. Last week it was 50 letters a day. Today there are 130. And 15 telegrams. I cannot read them all, much less answer them. Quite true, Padre. Here's one in Chinese, five in Arabic, many from Poland and Hungary. Pain and suffering is a universal language. Oh, oh what am I to do? You'll need a secretary to go through the correspondence and sort out the trivial from the essential... Questions any confessor could answer shouldn't be proposed to Padre Pio. Yes, yes. One should seek the ordinary ways God has given man for spiritual guidance. Often, I've had to tell a person who has come miles to see me that an Ave Maria on his knees at home would have been sufficient. Here is a letter from a girl asking if she is in a state of grace. If a person has faith in the efficacy of the sacrament of penance, she ought not ask such a question. Here's a telegram from a senor from Chile. He's pressed for time and would like to be confessed on Tuesday. Oh. Oh. Oh, he must wait his turn. There are many ahead of him. And that brings up another question. There are always more people than you can confess. They wait patiently, and they go home, and they come back. Others arrive at two in the morning to be the first in line. And not only that, it's unseemly to see the women shoving and fighting to get in first. And I'm sure they neglect to tell Padre Pio how they elbow their neighbors out of the way when they get to the confession box. Well, now, there's only one thing to do, and that's to issue appointment cards, giving the day and the time each should come to confession. What is that? Blasting. A modern highway is to be built from Manfredonia to San Giovanni. The bus company is helping to finance it. Because of the stigmata, the road to San Giovanni is widened. Yes, Padre, many changes are taking place about us in the material world because of the stigmata. A modern road, a hotel in the village, two new clerks in the post office, a gasoline station off the square. It's disgraceful. Everyone trying to make money out of Padre Pio. A man was arrested for selling what he claimed were bandages from the Padre's wounds. 
Never allow your soul to be disturbed by the sad spectacle of human injustice. But Padre, he was selling Remember, back. Padre Leone, in the general economy, this spectacle has its place. And on it, one day, you will see the inevitable triumph of divine justice. I just don't understand. How can injustice have any relation to a triumph of divine justice? Who comes to confession? He who has sinned or the pure of heart. Reverend Father, a friend of mine, a very distinguished man, incidentally, wrote directly to Padre Pio, but when the reply came, it was... From a secretary. As you should know, Signore, since 1923, the Vatican has directed I cease writing letters. And he gave wide publicity to the edict. What? A letter written and signed by Padre Pio would be treasured by the recipient. No doubt, but we have had to notify collectors that any letter written after 1923 is patently false. I... I... I ask you all to kneel in prayer. Please, please, do as I ask. We must pray for a soul that is soon to appear before the tribunal of God. Have mercy, O Lord, on the soul of this modest and courageous man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 For whom was our prayer? The King of of England. But, Padre, only this afternoon I read in the paper the king has only a slight attack of influenza and his condition is not serious. It is as I say, Signore. You say it was last night that Father Pio visited you here in your cell? I was writing late last night when I heard, or I thought I heard, a knock at my door. I opened it. Padre Pio was there. He said, let us pray for a soul which at this moment is to appear before the tribunal of God. We prayed. And he told me... It was for the king of England. Can you tell me what time it was? It's important, the time. Uh, about midnight. The afternoon paper has just arrived. Look. King George the Sixth of England dies. Notice the time. Pronounced dead one minute after midnight. <laughs> My dear brothers, I have been taking a long time, but it is with a purpose. We are willing listeners, Padre. Please go on, Padre. My patients benefit from what you tell me. Doctor... In every sick man, there is Jesus in person who is suffering. In every poor man, it is Jesus himself who is languishing. In every sick and poor, Jesus is doubly visible. The time has come for our actions to be such that our Lord may say to us, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was suffering, and you cared for me and comforted me. Now, I have here a small gold coin. Take it, Reverend Father. How shall I use it? I wish to be the first to give a donation toward the hospital. The hospital? We must build the hospital for the relief of the suffering and the poor. Here? Yes. On this barren, rocky mountain slope, 
1,800 feet above sea level, 25 miles away from the nearest industrial center? Have you any idea what the cost will be? No, no, I have no head for such things. But I have faith. Whatever amount is necessary will be forthcoming. And that very night, two lira were given by a blind man. And then little offerings began to pour in as soon as the plan was known. And then came a donation of 1,300,000 lira. And then in 1947, 250 million lira from the United Nations. Oh, from time to time the work was interrupted because of lack of funds, but the prayers of Padre Pio were always heard. And today the home for the relief of the suffering is one of the most beautiful and modern hospitals in Europe. The stigma to never left Padre Pio and caused him such pain that he was never able to close his hands. And when he had to come downstairs, he was forced to descend backwards, step by step. In September 1968, his health began to fail. On September 23, he rose suddenly from his cot. What? What time is it? Two hours until dawn. I do not feel like sleeping. Perhaps I'm not feeling very well. Do you wish me to call anyone? No. It is not necessary. He who wants to call me has already called me. Tell me, have you said Mass this morning? No, Padre. Now is the time to say one for me. Padre Pio died at 2.30 in the morning. During the 50 years he bore the stigmata, he heard the confessions of thousands and consoled and led back to God innumerable souls. There were many who believed he was a saint, blessed with the power to perform miracles. The church, however, does not assess such qualities in living persons. And time will have to pass before a judgment is made on Padre Pio. His usual answer was to anyone who thanked him for a cure. I performed no miracle. All I did was pray for you. And God cured you. Thank him, not me. Regardless of what time holds in store, individuals, rich and poor, in all parts of the world can and do say, Thank God for Padre Pio. shedding of blood in the valley of Sorek. The jackal has nothing to complain of. The entrance to the valley of Sorek is about ten miles west of Jerusalem. Good grazing land there, and water. Thorn scrub for the camels, 
green grass on the slopes of the hills for the horses. Alda Ben Eben, the Bedouin Arab, has taken possession of the valley. Not without a battle, but cost him the use of his two legs. Send my brother Sidian to me. I want to see my brother Sidian. You don't have to shout. I can hear. I don't like your tone of voice, Sidian. How do you feel today? I'm not dead, so don't build up your hopes. I don't want you to die. It'll be the happiest day of your life. Sit down, I want to talk. What about? My legs. These two useless legs. Are they no better? Worse. Getting worse every day. Well, you must be patient. Sidian, what's all this about some Nazarene? What Nazarene? Some fellow who goes around doing miracles, healing people. They say he brought a dead man to life in Bethany, a man named Lazarus. Well, you believe it? I want to see this Nazarene. Jesus, they call him. You want me to send for him? No. If he comes here, he'll see I'm rich. He'll ask a lot of money. If he could cure you, it'd be worth a lot of money. But if he could cure me for nothing? He can't cure you. There's a chance he can. Sidian. Yes? Suppose you take me to him. Just you and I. Take you to him. You can't walk. You can't even ride. Have a litter made for me. It can be pulled by a horse. Well, I suppose that could be done. Just you and I, Sidia. No servants, no warriors. I'll just be a poor man. I think it'll be a waste of time. But we'll do it just the same. You have the litter made. Beyond the Valley of Sorek, the desert... The hot sun, a white ball of fire behind a misty haze. Columns of heat drifting through the hushed silence. Two horses. One pulls a litter. The Arab chieftain, Outer Ben Even, lies there on it. Beside him rides his brother, Sidian. You look discontented, Sidian. I am. <laughs> Did you bring money with you? Just one bag of gold in case the Nazarene wants money. You should have had a canopy made over this litter to shield me from the sun. I don't like being talked to like a servant. You are a servant, Sidian. Not when you're dead, I won't be. I'll be chief. What? I'll be chief. You jackal. I'm no jackal. I'm no servant. Huh? There's a wind coming up. Sandstorm. Get a move on. Oh! What are you stopping for? You're not going any further. What? What is it, Jackal? I'll take that bag of gold. Give it to me. <gasps> you died in the sandstorm. Our people will grieve and I'll take your place. You'd murder me. No, I'm just leaving you here. It's murder. I hate you. I can't live in this sand. I'll be smothered. Goodbye, Ada Ben Eben. No, I won't die, Sidian. I'll live. You hear me, Sidian? I'll live. I'll live, Sidian. I won't die. I won't die. Drink. What? Drink this. It's water. Water. That, that's enough for now. How did I... Your horse pulled you here. I found you. My horse? Where's my horse? He's all right. I, I gave him water. Oh, I didn't die. The storm passed very quickly. <laughs> I didn't die. Here. Here, drink again. Who 
are you? Rachel. Rachel? Of what family? Doesn't matter. You put me here, under this palm tree? Of course. You've been good to me. Why? Must one have a reason for helping someone? I have no money. I can't pay you. Why should you pay me? For what? I'm a poor man, a, a farmer and a cripple. I, I can't walk. Why bother with me? You needed help. You still do. You're a strange woman. I'll go and find some food. Food? Where will you find it? In the town. I'll come back to town? you. Town? What town? Jerusalem. This is the road between Jerusalem and Bethany. Bethany? That's where he is. Jesus? How do you know I mean the Nazarene? You're crippled. You want him to heal you. It's a very common thing. Oh, it is, eh? He really does heal people? He healed me. Were you sick? I was lost. He cleansed me. Lost? What's that mean? Just rest. I'll come back. What do you mean, he cleansed you? No good man or woman could bear the sight of me. I was filled with sin. And he made me whole and clean again. Will you take me to him? Yes, but I'll go for food first. I'll come back. So the man lies there, under a palm tree on the desert road between Bethany and Jerusalem. The sun goes down in a blaze of red, orange, and yellow, and suddenly it's night. Cool, desert night. And the woman comes back. Bread. Huh? Some fowl and a little wine. <laughs> I was starving. Eat. Just eat. <sighs> Good. Well, what's wrong? I heard some bad news in Jerusalem. Bad? They're talking against him. Against who? Jesus. They're saying he should be put to death. Why? Because he says he's the son of God. They claim it's a crime. What can we do? He must be warned. He's expected in Jerusalem tomorrow. He mustn't go there. Tomorrow. And I'll be coming along this road. Perhaps I should go to Bethany tonight. Huh? To warn him not to go to Jerusalem. And leave me here? His life is in danger. How can that be? You say he's the son of God. If he has enemies, he can destroy them. I hadn't thought of that. Tomorrow, he'll come this way. You can let him know what's going on. Yes. Then talk to him about me. Ask him to heal me. Yes. Yes, all right. A jackal. Uh, reminds me of someone. You know who? Now, how would you know? My brother. He left me to die in that storm. You know what I'm going to have done to him? To you your brother? I'll have him tied up to a pole in the hot sun. No water. Maybe salt water, huh? <laughs> That's it. Salt water. Your brother harmed you? Robbed me. Left me to die. Told me he hated me. Forgive him. Forgive him? Jesus would tell you to forgive your brother. <laughs> That's a good joke. <laughs> Morning. There's a, a dust cloud along the road. I think a crowd's coming this way. Jesus must be coming. You think he's with them? Yes. What are they doing? 
What what are they all doing? Throwing palm leaves on the road for him to walk over. You think he was some prince? Oh, he is. He's the prince of heaven. forget. Master. Master. Daughter, you grieve. Lord Jesus, they're plotting against you in Jerusalem. Tell them about me. Master, heal me. Heal my leg so I can walk again. First, cleanse your heart of hatred against your brother Sidian. How did he know about my brother? How did he know I had one? He, he even knew my brother's name. He's gone. We can follow him. He said I mustn't hate my brother. I have a right to hate him. Have you? He left me to die. Jesus says we must love even those who do us harm. He says, as we forgive them, so we'll be forgiven. You believe that, huh? I believe in Jesus. I believe what he taught me. You do, eh? I'll set your horse. You're... We're going to the city? By the time we get there... Try to forgive your brother. Jerusalem, like any other city of the East, narrow winding streets littered with refuse, clouds of flies, the smell of a camel market. All races of mankind, Syrian, Greek, Roman, Indian, all kinds, the water carrier, Money changers, merchants, thieves, the rich and the poor. It was night when the woman Rachel brought the crippled Arab chief within sight of the city gate. You must be worn out. Rest a while. Oh. We'll have to wait outside the city until morning. Why? They won't let us in through the gate. Uh -huh. We'll camp here. You're good with that horse, Rachel. He's a beautiful animal. Uh -huh. He should be. A funny look on your face, Rachel. What's wrong? I'm wondering why you lied to me about yourself. Lied to you? You're not a farmer. Nor are you a poor man. <laughs> You're right. Rachel... You know who Aura Ben Ibn is? An Arab raider. He murdered my family in the Valley of Sorek. my blanket over you. No, I don't need it. Please, please don't take it off. Rachel. Yes? That's the way it is in the desert. How did your people get the valley? They drove someone else out. I suppose so. You hate me, huh? Would Jesus hate you? The Nazarene? How do I know? What's he got to do with this? He has to do with me. How? I serve him. Oh? What's that mean? I try to follow his teachings. What would he tell you to do in this case? Forgive you. That's strange. I killed your family. 
And you're supposed to forgive me. I do forgive you. That is strange. When you first told me who you were, it wasn't easy to forgive you. I had to pray. Pray for strength. And strength came to me. Now sleep. Someone coming out of the city. That horse. Beautiful animal. Pure blood. You know the man riding? I know him. It's me, Sidian. Yes, it is you. I didn't die after all. I know. You knew? I was coming to look for you. How did you know I was alive? He told me. Who? The Nazarene. He rode into the city. He passed where I stood and looked at me. He called me by name. Sidian, he said, go forth and find your brother who is alive and with a woman called Rachel. He knew who you were, right? He is a good man. I... I listened to you and... and remember the look on his face when I saw him. You saw him? He told me to put aside my hate for you. So you saw him. But he didn't heal you. He will. He will, sit and because... I've forgiven you. What? I forgive you, Sidian. Come, my brother. Let me embrace you. slept all night. I've been thinking about all Those of... people in the city, they really want to kill the Nazarene. They're all crazed. I've got to find him, Sidian. We'll find him. Is, uh, is she asleep? Oh, like a child. Pretty, huh? If the Nazarene heals me, I'll make her my wife. <coughs> oh, no. What is it? Oh. She had a bad dream. Oh, something woke me up. A, a sound. The crowing of a cock? I don't know. I don't know why it's so cold. Shivering. The hour, it's dawn. The hour of, of betrayal. Betrayal? I, I don't know. I, I think I was dreaming. Something's happened to him. I know. I feel it. We've, we've got to go inside the city. Find him. We must find him. Something's happened. Within the city walls, the glare of the morning sun and the mob, a sea of faces packing every street in Jerusalem, the rabble bent on killing a good man called Jesus. And through the mob comes the woman Rachel and the man Sidian, carrying between them the crippled Arab chieftain, Outer Ben Eden. They come within sight of the Nazarene at last. A lonely, abandoned figure, the mob staring at him, a little afraid of him, though ready to prevent his escape should he try. But he stands there, his eyes lifted toward heaven. There he is. Careful what you say. This mob's dangerous. If I had my fighting men here... To invade this city? Why not? And rescue the Nazarene. We'll do it. As soon as he heals me, you ride back to the valley. Bring the men with you. Master, heal me. Heal me. You can if you will. Master, heal me. I have forgiven my brother. Your faith. Shall make you whole. My son, 
rise up and walk. Me. I'm healed. Look at me. A miracle. The Nazarene healed me. He healed me. See him, Rachel. He's truly the son of God. And they're taking him away. They're going to kill him. You fools. Cowards and fools. Sit in your horse and ride. Be back before sundown with 2,000 fighting men. We'll save the Nazarene. Meet me at sundown outside the city. Rachel, I'm healed. You see, he made me whole. Look at him. They're taking him away. Master, Master, why don't you save yourself? We'll save him. We'll save him. Save him if you cried. We'll save him. But their voices drown in the roar of the multitude. The hours pass. The sun goes down. Outside the city, out of Ben Even, waits with a woman Rachel in the shadows of the city wall. Where are they? Where are my fighting men? Jesus would be against what you planned. To save him? Don't you see you were right? Right when you said, if he wants to save himself, he can. And he will. You think so? If he wants to. But he's against violence. He's a man of peace. Look. A dust cloud moving in the desert. Very small one. Only one rider. Sidian. Sidian alone. Sidian, where are the men? Uh. Not coming. Not coming? They wouldn't listen to me. They think I killed you. They think I want to capture Jerusalem. Make myself prince of it. I had to escape before they killed me. There were others like out of Ben Even. Men who wanted to lead armies into the city of Jerusalem to save our blessed Lord. The strange thing was, for one reason or another, none of these armies moved. And the trial of Jesus was started. Save yourself, some had cried the few who wept for Jesus. But our Lord had come to die for us. with Fuller Seminary proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Sweeter as the days go by, sweeter as the days go by. 
service pen down here happy shaking hands with one another folks come on sing heavenly sunshine with me will you go ahead i'll help you all right and that's it sing it right out Give them a good hand, everybody. That's wonderful. And now, everybody, lift it up once more. That's some of the best singing I've heard for a long, long time. Many of you have written in asking me to sing Heavenly Sunshine. It's very generous of you, but it'll take a couple of weeks for me to vocalize and have my voice in shape. And a little bit later on the broadcast, I'll be speaking upon this important subject, the sign of the end of the age. I want you to have your Bibles ready and your pencil and paper, and we're going to look into God's Word. And isn't it wonderful, friends of the radio audience, to realize that we are actually labors together with God and with one another in this tremendous worldwide radio ministry. I am thinking today shall reach when the sun goeth down, when 
Take her radio 
and she hopes that where she goes, people will turn on this hour. She says, thank you for all the help that you've given me. The book of Ephesians will always remind me of you, Mr. Fuller. I'm sending some to help out. A good letter comes from a young man in England who is so happy that this program can be heard there, and he wants to help increase the large listening audience. He says, you may be interested to know that I have advertised your program in a number of papers every week. Six papers, he mentions, there in England. And he says, do you have any posters available? No, we have no posters. He continues, thank you for all your wonderful work in bringing this program to us. It means much to us who are needing the guidance and fellowship of spiritual Christians. The signs of multiplying wickedness are unmistakable all around in these days. You are daily in my prayers, Mr. Fuller. Well, one of our seminary professors has been in England this summer, where he has been speaking at Keswick Conference and at Westminster Chapel and other places, and he has had warm, wonderful fellowship with fine, believing leaders there. But on the whole, as in this country, there's a great pall of indifference to spiritual things. Now, understand me, some fine, conservative, gospel-preaching leaders and groups of spiritual-minded men and women, but as in this country, much indifference, and the broadcast is needed abroad. We're so glad that this program can carry the light of the gospel in the British Isles and Europe, though it must be heard in the midnight darkness, mostly from 11 to 12 midnight. But people do wait up to hear it. And we're thankful. We ask the prayers of you friends here in this country as well as abroad for this gospel ministry, missionary ministry in Europe and the British Isles. And then here's a letter from four of our servicemen who probably heard of the broadcast because of the advertising of this young man that I just, whose letter I just read to you. Dear Reverend Fuller, we are four airmen stationed in France who meet quite frequently to talk and learn more about our Savior. <clears throat> We hear your program relayed to us over Radio Luxembourg, and we would like to express our appreciation for your faithfulness to the Word of God, and are thankful that we can hear a gospel message such as yours over in this foreign country. <clears throat> we look forward to the weekly broadcasts every Thursday night. We would like for you to know that your advertisement in the New York Herald, which is published in Paris daily, was brought to the attention of several men on this base, and we are sure that many others see it that we do not know of. It is a program that is meeting, meet, reaching our men abroad and is much needed. And then this last letter, dear Reverend Fuller, our brother, who was in the Air Force in Korea, has saved to buy a short wave set. So now he can hear the old-fashioned revival hour quite regularly. It is a great comfort and inspiration to him, and he's also working on a Bible correspondence course in his spare time. That is all I shall have time for today, friends. A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and life. The master made answer in words to and plain, He must be born again. He must be born again. He must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, He must be born again. Ye children of men, attend to the word. So solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord, and let not this message to you be in vain. He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Verses of number 113. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die, and remain standing for prayer. Everyone taking part, singing out heartily, singing in the Spirit.
son Daniel Fuller will lead us to the throne. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee that in the midst of this world so filled with anxiety and bereavement and heartache, that up where thou dwellest, there is peace and joy and love. And Father, we're thankful that for those of us who found our sight at the cross of Christ, that we can have thy heavenly sunshine dwelling in the midst of our hearts, even though we walk in the midst of this wilderness way. Father, we pray today for those who feel themselves almost to be defeated, who feel themselves to be boxed in by four corners. Lord, we pray that they may look upward and see Christ and come to know the way out of their difficulty. Father, we pray especially today for the men in prison. We pray that Christ may minister to them, that they may be comforted, that they may receive patience. And Father, we pray especially that they, as they come to know Christ, may find that they have a purpose for their lives, even though they be behind prison bars. And Father, in the midst of this world in which there is so much woe and tribulation, we are glad for the blessed hope of the soon coming, we believe, of, of Christ thy Son. And so, Father, we pray today, come quickly, Lord Jesus, for we look forward to his coming. In Jesus' name, amen.
but it real. It's real. All I know is real. Great All I know. Such a life of fear and doubt For I wanted God to give me something I would know about So the truth would make me happy And the light would clearly shine And the Spirit give assurance that I'm His And He is mine But it's real, it's real, it's real, oh, I know, I know it's real, it's gone to the dark heart's for I know. Just so quick, salvation reached me. Oh, bless God, I know it's real. Yes, it's real. It's real. Listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message today is titled Signs of the End of the Age. Open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 7, as we rejoin the broadcast. I'll return after Dr. Fuller's message to give you information on the various resources available from this ministry. Watching with prayer and 
Turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verse 7, speaking upon the sign of the end of the age. Two prophetic utterances from the lips of the Lord Jesus are recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and in Luke 21. These prophetic discourses, the Mount Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and the temple discourse in Luke 21 not only outline the general characteristics of the days between our Lord's first and second advent, but also outlines the end days, the last days of this present age. Hence, Luke 21, 7, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? In our previous broadcasts, we have shown you from the word of God that the return and recognition of Israel as a nation marks the beginning not only of the budding of the fig tree, but the beginning of that period designated in God's word as the last day. The last day's period will end at the personal return of Christ to this earth when he comes the second time. On May 1948, over four years ago, when Israel was recognized as a nation, marks, therefore, the beginning of the last day's period. And we conclude that we are now in the last period of, or in the last days, that end time period of this age, the latter times, the last days, are now upon us. May God's word burn its way into your heart. Why so positive? Because the word of God is the foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Furthermore, in these two prophetic utterances, the Lord sets forth the sign of the end of the age. For note the question the disciples asked in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 3, the latter part of that verse, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the sign of the end or the completion or the consummation? of the age. What sign, according to Luke, will there be when these things shall come to pass? Now, in last Sunday's broadcast, we spoke of certain signs, the signs of the times. Follow carefully. That is, God's word revealed that in between the Lord's first and second advents, when certain signs come to pass, then know that you are on the threshold are about to see the beginnings of the last day's period, that is, days between the recognition of Israel and the personal visible return of Christ from glory. We gave you just a few of those signs. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3, the return and the regathering of Israel is taking place right before our eyes. The budding of the fig tree, the great apostasy, 
many departing from the faith, or some departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, going away from God's word. God's word doesn't have the place of final authority that it had when our fathers were here, especially the second, first and second generations past. The moral breakdown of civilization. Second Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Read it for yourself. The bitter conflict between labor and capital. James 5, 1 to 6. And then the repetition of the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And the days of Noah marked by violence and bloodshed and tumults and rebellions. The days of Lot being marked by prominence of everything sexy. We're certainly getting it thrown at us these days from every angle. The days of Lot, the letdown of moral standards are here upon us, and may we wake up. Now these signs are upon us. Add these signs to that of the budding of the fig tree, the return and recognition of Israel, and I believe personally we have positive proof that we are now in the end day periods of this age, eleventh hour work. But note, please, the disciples did not ask for signs, but asked for the sign of the completion, the consummation of the or the end of the age. Now the Lord answers the disciples, and his answers are found in Matthew on the Olivet Discourse, Mark doesn't add anything thereto, but there are some additions in the Temple Discourse of Luke 21. And so we are going to study and meditate upon these two outstanding prophetic utterances and find the answer to this all-important question, what is the sign of the end of the age. Never in 35 years have I given a message that I am so certain of and so impelled to give as I am today. And I trust that his word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, quick and powerful, penetrate your darkened hearts and you'll cry out, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And cry the penitence prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Christ. First, may we meditate in some detail upon Matthew 24, 6 to 8. Then second, meditate upon Luke 21, 9 to 11. Mark these down now. First, upon Matthew 24, 6 to 8. And may the Holy Spirit enlighten our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, enabling us to see spiritual things and be worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man, not ashamed at his coming, but hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now notice in Matthew 24, 6 to 8, and I want you to follow carefully and save any questions in your mind until you hear through to the end. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. That is, wars, actual encounters, actual conflicts between certain nations. We have had these from time immemorial, ever since the entrance of sin into the human race. Nothing unusual about that. Rumors designates the brewing of conflict, propaganda leading to actual conflict. But now will you notice, see that she be not trouble, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, the word end and the word must mean, the word must, for example, means it is necessary for them to come to pass, but the end is not yet. That is the end of the age or the end of the present era during which our Lord is absent. It's not yet. But bear in mind, these verses are an answer, especially from 7 to 9 to 8. These verses 
answer the question, what is the sign? Notice the little word for in verse 7. We skip over it. We don't dwell upon it. It's a very important word. And he goes on to tell us what will come to pass in the end days. For now notice, verse 6, we've had nothing startling about that. But verse 7, here it is. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now, follow through. Here is an explanation of that which has been stated. Nation against nation. This means major conflict involving the majority of nations and war on a worldwide scale. That is, world wars will mark the last days. Isn't it interesting? Dreadful, though, that in 1914 to 17, we had a world war. 25 or 24 years later, world war number two. And now, within a short period of 10 years, the talk of a dreadful third world war, things are coming to pass with greater rapidity. Nations arming to the teeth. Now, God said, when nations, worldwide conflicts come, coupled with famines and pestilences and earthquakes, these have been frequent over the past centuries, common and deadly over the past 20 centuries. The meaning is this. When you have world war coupled with the budding of the fig tree, coupled with famines and pestilences, then earthquake, then be especially watchful. Lift up your head, for the day of your redemption draweth nigh. And so we conclude here that when nation arises against nation, when famines and pestilences and earthquakes shall be intensified, will be of more frequent in occurrences, these things constitute the sign of the end of the age. We've had to devastate. God is simply ringing the doorbell, saying to you, Behold, I come. Verse 8 of Matthew 24. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. Unfortunately, the word sorrows is put in the King James. It should be the beginning of travail, or better still, birth pang. That is, goes back to an Old Testament teaching, which I'll not have time to enter into, in different Old Testament prophets. Israel, now returning in unbelief, will go through birth pangs. And before she sees her Messiah coming in power and great glory, and look upon him whom they have pierced and are reconciled to him, before that nation, now regathered, now recognized, in Palestine, there in unbelief, receives a new heart and a new spirit within him, that is, are born the leading nation in a day with Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. That nation will go through birth pang, will prevail as a mother about to give birth to her child, will go through the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, such as the world has never seen. And that will be just prior to the birth of that nation when the Son of Man a greater than David, comes and occupies the throne of his father David. And then nations will learn war no more, not until then. Luke 21, 9 to 11. Let's find out some additional characteristics of the sign of the end of the age. Here we have almost the same the teaching or the same Words is appearing in Matthew, but note in addition, this word, here it is, 
But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. And they have come to pass. Hardly a generation in this old earth free from wars and commotions. Be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end, now notice it, is not by and by, or better is not come yet. Then, that little word then in verse 10, here we have the rising of nations against nation. And this little word then separates that which has already taken place with that which is the sign of the end of the age. Then said he unto them. Now notice the distinction. Carefully study your word, your Bible. Then nation shall rise against nation and kingdom and kingdom and great earthquake. Not little a little uh, four and a half and seven and one and six and one and on the Richter scale. It may go beyond the ten or devastation point on the Richter earthquake scale. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famine and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Then, now beloved, when war breaks out on a worldwide scale and scope, then there shall be these things that not only Matthew speaks of, but Luke speaks of. Fearful sights, things that fill with fear, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now follow me carefully. In the book of Revelation, two worldwide wars are predicted. Turn with me to Revelation, the sixth chapter. Two worldwide wars which have not yet come to pass, in my humble judgment, but may come to pass overnight. And in Revelation 6, 4, there went out another horse that was red. Could it be communism? I don't know. And the power was given to him that set thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The second world war, just prior to the day of the Lord, is found in the 16th chapter of Revelation, verse 14. Here it is. For they are spirits of demons, working miracles, notice it, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. After the world war of Revelation 6, then all nations will be drawn into the plains of Megiddo to fight against Israel, and the battle of Armageddon will take place, and just as the nations are about to press Israel and defeat Israel suddenly, the clouds of heaven will part and the Son of Man will come, the captain of their salvation, and fight for Israel as he did in the days of yore. And then they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, become reconciled to him in a day in a nation born in an hour, and all Israel shall be saved. Brother, listen. The recognition and return has already taken place. The end time, when the world wars break out, coupled with these other things, I don't like. If you ever needed a place of refuge, you need it now. If you ever need to be hidden away until the time of indignation passes over, no one stirring, please. I'm dealing with the souls of men. If you ever needed a place of refuge, Security and safety and salvation. You need that place now. And the time is coming when the kings of earth and the great men and the rich men and the captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman will try to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And Satan rocks. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne 
and for the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come to be able to stand. He's saying to you, now is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts as in the day of providence. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Everyone still before him. I've given you God's word. I've warned you. And I say on the authority of God's word that there's only one way of escape, and that's through Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you outside of Christ in the radio audience, bow where you are, kneel if you can, and give your hearts to Christ today and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And while our heads are bowed in this splendid visible audience in Long Beach today, how many will quickly put their hands up and say, Brother Fuller, pray for me. I want to receive Christ as my personal Savior today and like to be remembered in a word of prayer. Will you put your hand up and say, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Hands going up all over the lower part of this auditorium. I hope I can acknowledge everyone. Anyone else here on the lower floor? Put your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another hand here on the lower floor before I go to the balcony? God bless you. Another one back there. God bless you. Up in the balconies to my right. God bless you way up there. Yes. Other hands there. God bless you. The balconies to the rear. Put your hand up and say, pray for me. I need Christ. Yes, God bless you. Another hand. The balconies to the left. Is there another hand just before we close? Put your hand up and say, Brother Fuller, remember me in prayer. I want Christ. God bless you. Another sailor lad. I must close. Continue in prayer as we leave the air. This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye and God's richest blessing upon you. Cooperation with Fuller Seminary proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E.
service pen down here happy shaking hands with one another folks come on sing heavenly sunshine with me will you go ahead i'll help you all right and that's it sing it right out Give them a good hand, everybody. That's wonderful. And now, everybody, lift it up once more. That's some of the best singing I've heard for a long, long time. Many of you have written in asking me to sing Heavenly Sunshine. It's very generous of you, but it'll take a couple of weeks for me to vocalize and have my voice in shape. And a little bit later on the broadcast, I'll be speaking upon this important subject, the sign of the end of the age. I want you to have your Bibles ready and your pencil and paper, and we're going to look into God's Word. And isn't it wonderful, friends of the radio audience, to realize that we are actually labors together with God and with one another in this tremendous worldwide radio ministry. I am thinking today shall reach when the sun goeth down. When through wonderful grace by my Savior I stand, 
short vacation. She cannot take her radio, and she hopes that where she goes, people will turn on this hour. She says, thank you for all the help that you've given me. The book of Ephesians will always remind me of you, Mr. Fuller. 
I'm sending some to help out. A good letter comes from a young man in England who is so happy that this program can be heard there, and he wants to help increase the large listening audience. He says, you may be interested to know that I have advertised your program in a number of papers every week. Six papers, he mentions, there in England. And he says, do you have any posters available? No, we have no posters. He continues, thank you for all your wonderful work in bringing this program to us. It means much to us who are needing the guidance and fellowship of spiritual Christians. The signs of multiplying wickedness are unmistakable all around in these days. You are daily in my prayers, Mr. Fuller. Well, one of our seminary professors has been in England this summer, where he has been speaking at Keswick Conference and at Westminster Chapel and other places, and he has had warm, wonderful fellowship with fine, believing leaders there. But on the whole, as in this country, there's a great pall of indifference to spiritual things. Now, understand me, some fine, conservative, gospel-preaching leaders and groups of spiritual-minded men and women, but as in this country, much indifference, and the broadcast is needed abroad. We're so glad that this program can carry the light of the gospel in the British Isles and Europe, though it must be heard in the midnight darkness, mostly from 11 to 12 midnight. But people do wait up to hear it. And we're thankful. We ask the prayers of you friends here in this country as well as abroad for this gospel ministry, missionary ministry in Europe and the British Isles. And then here's a letter from four of our servicemen who probably heard of the broadcast because of the advertising of this young man that I just, whose letter I just read to you. Dear Reverend Fuller, we are four airmen stationed in France who meet quite frequently to talk and learn more about our Savior. <clears throat> We hear your program relayed to us over Radio Luxembourg, and we would like to express our appreciation for your faithfulness to the Word of God, and are thankful that we can hear a gospel message such as yours over in this foreign country. <clears throat> we look forward to the weekly broadcasts every Thursday night. We would like for you to know that your advertisement in the New York Herald, which is published in Paris daily, was brought to the attention of several men on this base, and we are sure that many others see it that we do not know of. It is a program that is reaching our men abroad and is much needed. And then this last letter, dear Reverend Fuller, our brother, who was in the Air Force in Korea, has saved to buy a short wave set. So now he can hear the old-fashioned revival hour quite regularly. It is a great comfort and inspiration to him, and he's also working on a Bible correspondence course in his spare time. That is all I should have time for today, friends. A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and life. The master made answer in words to and plain, He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, He must be born again. Ye children of men, attend to the word, so solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord, and let not this message to you be in vain. He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. He must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Verses of number 113. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die, and remain standing for prayer. Everyone taking part in singing out heartily, singing in the Spirit.
bow in prayer, and our son Daniel Fuller will lead us to the throne. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee that in the midst of this world so filled with anxiety and bereavement and heartache, that up where thou dwellest there is peace and joy and love. And Father, we're thankful that for those of us who found our sight at the cross of Christ, that we can have thy heavenly sunshine dwelling in the midst of our hearts, even though we walk in the midst of this wilderness way. Father, we pray today for those who feel themselves almost to be defeated, who feel themselves to be boxed in by four corners. Lord, we pray that they may look upward and see Christ and come to know the way out of their difficulty. Father, we pray especially today for the men in prison. We pray that Christ may minister to them, that they may be comforted, that they may receive patience. And Father, we pray especially that they, as they come to know Christ, may find that they have a purpose for their lives even though they be behind prison bars. And Father, in the midst of this world in which there is so much woe and tribulation, we are glad for the blessed hope of the soon coming, we believe, of, of Christ thy Son. And so, Father, we pray today, come quickly, Lord Jesus, for we look forward to his coming. In Jesus' name, amen.
but it real. It's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the For I know. Such a life of fear and doubt For I wanted God to give me something I would know about So the truth would make me happy And the light would clearly shine And the Spirit give assurance that I'm His And He is mine, but it's real, it's real, it's real, oh, I know, I know it's real, it's gone to the dark heart's for I know. Just so quick, salvation reached me. Oh, bless God, I know it's real. Yes, it's real. It's real. Listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message today is titled Signs of the End of the Age. Open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 7, as we rejoin the broadcast. I'll return after Dr. Fuller's message to give you information on the various resources available from this ministry. Nothing prevented. 
Turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verse 7, speaking upon the sign of the end of the age. Two prophetic utterances from the lips of the Lord Jesus are recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and in Luke 21. These prophetic discourses, the Mount Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and the temple discourse in Luke 21 not only outline the general characteristics of the days between our Lord's first and second advent, but also outlines the end days, the last days of this present age. Hence, Luke 21, 7, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? In our previous broadcasts, we have shown you from the word of God that the return and recognition of Israel as a nation marks the beginning not only of the budding of the fig tree, but the beginning of that period designated in God's word as the last day. The last day's period will end at the personal return of Christ to this earth when he comes the second time. On May 1948, over four years ago, when Israel was recognized as a nation, marks, therefore, the beginning of the last day's period. And we conclude that we are now in the last period of, or in the last days, that end time period of this age, the latter times, the last days, are now upon us. May God's word burn its way into your heart. Why so positive? Because the word of God is the foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Furthermore, in these two prophetic utterances, the Lord sets forth the sign of the end of the age. For note the question the disciples asked in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 3, the latter part of that verse, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the sign of the end or the completion or the consummation? of the age. What sign, according to Luke, will there be when these things shall come to pass? Now, in last Sunday's broadcast, we spoke of certain signs, the signs of the times. Follow carefully. That is, God's word revealed that in between the Lord's first and second advents, when certain signs come to pass, then know that you are on the threshold are about to see the beginnings of the last days period, that is, days between the recognition of Israel and the personal visible return of Christ from glory. We gave you just a few of those signs. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3, the return and the regathering of Israel taking place right before our eyes, the budding of the fig tree, the great apostasy, Many departing from the faith, or some departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, going away from God's word, 
God's word doesn't have the place of final authority that it had when our fathers were here, especially the second, first and second generations past. The moral breakdown of civilization. Second Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Read it for yourself. The bitter conflict between labor and capital. James 5, 1 to 6. And then the repetition of the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And the days of Noah marked by violence and bloodshed and tumults and rebellions. The days of Lot being marked by prominence of everything sexy. And we're certainly getting it thrown at us these days from every angle. The days of Lot, the letdown of moral standards are here upon us, and may we wake up. Now these signs are upon us. Add these signs to that of the budding of the fig tree, the return and recognition of Israel, and I believe personally we have positive proof that we are now in the end day periods of this age, eleventh hour work. But note, please, the disciples did not ask for signs, but asked for the sign of the completion, the consummation of the or the end of the age. Now the Lord answers the disciples, and his answers are found in Matthew on the Olivet Discourse, Mark doesn't add anything thereto, but there are some additions in the Temple Discourse of Luke 21. And so we are going to study and meditate upon these two outstanding prophetic utterances and find the answer to this all-important question, what is the sign of the end of the age. Never in 35 years have I given a message that I am so certain of and so impelled to give as I am today. And I trust that his word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, quick and powerful, penetrate your darkened hearts and you'll cry out, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And cry the penitence prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Christ. First, may we meditate in some detail upon Matthew 24, 6 to 8. Then second, meditate upon Luke 21, 9 to 11. Mark these down now. First, upon Matthew 24, 6 to 8. And may the Holy Spirit enlighten our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, enabling us to see spiritual things and be worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man, not ashamed at his coming, but hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now notice in Matthew 24, 6 to 8, and I want you to follow carefully and save any questions in your mind until you hear through to the end. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. That is, wars, actual encounters, actual conflicts between certain nations. We have had these from time immemorial, ever since the entrance of sin into the human race. Nothing unusual about that. Rumors designates the brewing of conflict, propaganda leading to actual conflict. But now will you notice, see that she be not trouble, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, the word end and the word must mean, the word must, for example, means it is necessary for them to come to pass, but the end is not yet. That is the end of the age or the end of the present era during which our Lord is absent. It's not yet. But bear in mind, these verses are an answer, especially from 7 to nine to 8. These verses answer the question, what is the sign? Notice the little word for in verse 7. We skip over it. 
we don't dwell upon it. It's a very important word. And he goes on to tell us what will come to pass in the end days. For now note it. Verse 6, we've had. Nothing startling about that. But verse 7, here it is. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now, follow through. Here is an explanation of that which has been stated. Nation against nation. This means major conflict involving the majority of nations and war on a worldwide scale. That is, world wars will mark the last days. Isn't it interesting? Dreadful, though, that in 1914 to 17, we had a world war. 25 or 24 years later, world war number two. And now, within a short period of 10 years, the talk of a dreadful third world war, things are coming to pass with greater rapidity. Nations arming to the teeth. Now, God said, when nations, worldwide conflicts come, coupled with famines and pestilences and earthquakes, these have been frequent over the past centuries, common and deadly over the past 20 centuries. The meaning is this. When you have world war coupled with the budding of the fig tree, coupled with famines and pestilences and then earthquakes, then be especially watchful. Lift up your head, for the day of your redemption draweth nigh. And so we conclude here that when nation arises against nation, when famines and pestilences and earthquakes shall be intensified, will be of more frequent in occurrences, these things constitute the sign of the end of the age. We've had to devast God is simply ringing the doorbell, saying to you, Behold, I come. Verse 8 of Matthew 24. All these things are the beginning of sorrow. Unfortunately, the word sorrows is put in the King James. It should be the beginning of travail, or better still, birth pang. That is, goes back to an Old Testament teaching, which I'll not have time to enter into, in different Old Testament prophets. Israel, now returning in unbelief, will go through birth pangs. And before she sees her Messiah coming in power and great glory, and look upon him whom they have pierced and are reconciled to him, before that nation, now regathered, now recognized, in Palestine, there in unbelief, receives a new heart and a new spirit within him, that is, are born the leading nation in a day with Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. That nation will go through birth pang, will prevail as a mother about to give birth to her child, will go through the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, such as the world has never seen. And that will be just prior to the birth of that nation when the Son of Man a greater than David, comes and occupies the throne of his father David, and then nations will learn war no more, not until then. Luke 21, 9 to 11. Let's find out some additional characteristics of the sign of the end of the age. Here we have almost the same the teaching or the same Words is appearing in Matthew, but note in addition, this word, here it is. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotion, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. And they have come to pass. 
hardly a generation in this old earth free from wars and commotions. Be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end, now notice it, is not by and by, or better is not come yet. Then, that little word then in verse 10, here we have the rising of nation against nation. And this little word then separates that which has already taken place with that which is the sign of the end of the age. Then said he unto them. Now notice the distinction. Carefully study your word, your Bible. Then nation shall rise against nation and kingdom and kingdom and great earthquake. Not little a little uh, four and a half and seven and one and six and one and on the Richter scale. It may go beyond the ten or devastation point on the Richter earthquake scale. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famine and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Then, now beloved, when war breaks out on a worldwide scale and scope, then there shall be these things that not only Matthew speaks of, but Luke speaks of. Fearful sights, things that fill with fear, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now follow me carefully. In the book of Revelation, two worldwide wars are predicted. Turn with me to Revelation, the sixth chapter. Two worldwide wars which have not yet come to pass, in my humble judgment, but may come to pass overnight. And in Revelation 6, 4, there went out another horse that was red. Could it be communism? I don't know. And the power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The second world war, just prior to the day of the Lord, is found in the 16th chapter of Revelation, verse 14. Here it is. For they are spirits of demons, working miracles, notice it, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. After the world war of Revelation 6, then all nations will be drawn into the plains of Megiddo to fight against Israel, and the battle of Armageddon will take place, and just as the nations are about to press Israel and defeat Israel suddenly, the clouds of heaven will part and the Son of Man will come, the captain of their salvation, and fight for Israel as he did in the days of yore. And then they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, become reconciled to him in a day in a nation born in an hour, and all Israel shall be saved. Brother, listen. The recognition and return has already taken place. The end time, when the world wars break out, coupled with these other things, I don't like. If you ever needed a place of refuge, you need it now. If you ever need to be hidden away until the time of indignation passes over, no one stirring, please. I'm dealing with the souls of men. If you ever needed a place of refuge, Security and safety and salvation. You need that place now. And the time is coming when the kings of earth and the great men and the rich men and the captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman will try to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And Satan rocks. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And for the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, to will be able to stand. He's saying to you, now is the day of salvation. 
Harden not your hearts as in the day of providence. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Everyone still before him. I've given you God's word. I've warned you. And I say on the authority of God's word that there's only one way of escape, and that's through Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you outside of Christ in the radio audience, bow where you are, kneel if you can, and give your hearts to Christ today and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And while our heads are bowed in this splendid visible audience in Long Beach today, how many will quickly put their hands up and say, Brother Fuller, pray for me. I want to receive Christ as my personal Savior today and like to be remembered in a word of prayer. Will you put your hand up and say, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. Hands going up all over the lower part of this auditorium. I hope I can acknowledge everyone. Anyone else here on the lower floor? Put your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another hand here on the lower floor before I go to the balcony? God bless you. Another one back there. God bless you. Up in the balconies to my right. God bless you way up there. Yes. Other hands there. God bless you. The balconies to the rear. Put your hand up and say, pray for me. I need Christ. Yes, God bless you. Another hand. The balconies to the left. Is there another hand just before we close? Put your hand up and say, Brother Fuller, remember me in prayer. I want Christ. God bless you. Another sailor lad. I must close. Continue in prayer as we leave the air. This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye and God's richest blessing upon you. National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, the Peabody Award-winning program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our special program today, 40 Voices, written by Mark Siegel, marks the 15th anniversary of the establishment of the State of Israel with a concert of music by the world-famous Renat Choir of Israel. Our narrator is Mr. Ben Grauer. Listen for just a moment to the music. You are listening to the voices of 40 men and women, citizens of Israel. 40 voices, singing with purity and discipline and faith in the capacity of man to endure, to strive, 
to shape a world of freedom and creativity and peace. Listen again as they sing in praise of the Creator in whose image man was made. For on Israel's 15th anniversary, these 40 voices speak with beauty in many ways man's hope. was founded in January of 1955. In its ranks, as in Israel's population, there are men and women of many backgrounds, of many origins. To this group, to join in common song, came men who had worked as carpenters and shoemakers, women who had been teachers and soldiers and settlers on the land. And yet in only three years, by 1958, the Renat Choir had achieved a unity and capacity that won its first prize in the International Choral Contest in Paris. By 1960, in Perugia, Italy, at the Festival of Religious Music, the Sagra Musicale Umbra, the choir was acclaimed as the outstanding choral group for its flawless performance of such works as the Hallelujah of Salomone Rossi, a 16th century Italian Jewish composer of sacred song. Under the direction of its distinguished young conductor, Gary Bettini, the Renat Choir performed last November in the celebration, launching the new National Cultural Center in Washington, D.C. It was the only overseas group invited to participate in this concert, attended by President and Mrs. Kennedy and 5,000 other leaders in government and the arts. At this concert, and during a three-and-a-half-week tour of the East and Middle West, sponsored by the Music Alliance of the America-Israel Cultural Foundation, these 40 voices, striving for perfection in performance, strove also for a harmony among peoples. A favorite of audiences everywhere was Orlando de Lasso's delicate and demanding echo song.
In the large repertoire of the Renat Choir, the music which reaches most poignantly to the hearts of Israel's people is the music which reaches to the past, or touches the present, or scans the future of the land of Israel itself. And there are songs, like the one you are hearing now, which do all three. Hamavdil, the traditional melody reworked by the contemporary Israeli composer Aden Partosh. Its subject, a farewell to the Sabbath as the new week is welcomed, and an eternal hopefulness in tomorrow, and the coming of the forerunner of redemption, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. year of triumphant statehood, Israel is a vigorous, muscular, striving young nation. Yet, beneath the surface, the scars of the tragic years of Nazism and the Hitler terror are still fresh. For if it is 15 years since Israel's rebirth, it is only 20 since the heroic uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. The way of life of the Jewish communities of Eastern Europe was destroyed a decade before Israel's independence was declared. But it is remembered in the music of its people, with poignancy and with affection. In a tiny room that burns a fire. And before it, the teacher instills a love of learning in his young students, along with the Aleph Days, the ABC of the Hebrew language.
Of the many efforts Israel has undertaken in its first 15 years, none has captured the imagination of the world more than the giant steps taken to transform the Negev, the country's barren southern desert area, into a productive, livable, integrated section of the country. The conquest of the desert is a tough, hard reality for the pioneers and settlers who, in our time, are making the desert to bloom as the rose. But an echo of the romance which is the desert has found its way into Israel's popular music. Here is Hitra Gu'ut, a folk song which draws on the musical tradition of the Persian Jewish community. Arranged by the distinguished Israeli composer Paul ben Haim, it features the mezzo-soprano voice of Ilana Brookman. Its idyllic story? There is an oasis in the desert. When you and I find it, there will be peace, there will be contentment. It is not only the desert which is being reclaimed in Israel, it is a people. And it is above all in the human realm that the first 15 years have been years of glorious achievement. Count with wonder a small nation's social progress. The hospitals built, the diseases conquered, the schools quadrupled, the universities erected, the nurseries and settlement houses, the children's villages, these and the flowering of the arts and scholarship of science and invention. All find expression in the dancing feet of Israel's rising generation and the songs it sings. Hora by Mark Lavery. <laughs> Social progress is not a new development in the history of the Jewish people. The Sabbath, the day of rest, is a social achievement as old as the Mosaic tradition. In Shir Shabbat, Song of the Sabbath, Issachar Miron has composed a tribute to the day of rest, a day of love among brothers which brings a blessing and lifts weary men from their weekday toil. Oh, my God. 
In a land which has known miracles, the greatest miracle of all in Israel's first 15 years has been the ingathering of its people from every corner of the earth. They have come by land and sea and air, from the sophisticated capitals of Western Europe and the feudal bondage of despotic Middle Eastern lands. They have fled from persecution in North Africa, revolution and counter-revolution in Eastern Europe. Yet for all who have come, the gates of Israel have been open, open wide and welcome. To an ancient culture, the accents of many languages, the differences of many ways have been added, and each has enriched what was already there. To the rhythm of an oriental tambour, the Renat choir captures some of the color and variety which is Israel today in a recounting of the ancient survival of the Jewish people in the time of Moses. The song is Miracle of Miracles by Wyatt Mon. The soloists are Gershon Etzbioni and Nathan Magalhães. Tel Aviv, in a crowded, hushed room. David Ben-Gurion, his voice confident, yet betraying the emotion of the hour, read aloud the Declaration of Independence that formally created the State of Israel. It is only 15 years, only a tiny fragment in the stream of time and history. But the document already stands with the noblest utterances of mankind, for it set the feet of a people on a path more than 2,000 years old. It was a declaration not only of independence, but of dedication to a prophetic vision for all mankind. The vision of universal brotherhood and peace, first voiced by the prophets of the Book of Books. On this 15th anniversary of Israel's rebirth, to close its performance, the Renat Choir, to music by Emmanuel Amiran, sings the words of that ancient prophecy, Ki Mitzion, Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Forty voices, but they sing for all of Israel's people. Forty voices, but they sing all mankind's hope for a time of justice, brotherhood, and peace that is yet to come. If you would like a copy of today's script, 
please send your name and address, with ten cents to cover the cost of postage and handling, to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. And now we take great pleasure in presenting His Excellency, the Honorable Avraham Harman, Ambassador of Israel to the United States. Ambassador Harman. As we in Israel celebrate the 15th anniversary of our independence, we wish to express our appreciation to the international community which welcomed us into the family of free nations and which has over the years helped us in many ways to utilize our independence for the advancement of our people. At the same time, we wish to express a word of welcome to the many nations which have emerged into independence and freedom during the past 15 years. Fifteen years is not a long period in the life of a people. We have not solved all our problems, nor have we attained the full expression of our capacity. This has been a period of the laying of foundations. During these 15 years, we have created the pattern of democratic self-government, of a fearless and independent judiciary, of a free press. We have created strong foundations for economic growth and advancement. Thanks to these efforts, our population has grown threefold during these 15 years, and upwards of a million homeless Jewish refugees have been able to find in our midst the advantages of rooted citizenship and gainful employment. The atmosphere for free cultural expression created during this period has already begun to produce significant results. In the international sphere, we have established normal and mutually beneficial relations with countries all over the world. Having ourselves received international technical assistance, we are now, in our own small way, beginning to participate in the historic movement of international technical cooperation. The future of independent Israel will be dedicated to the concept that independence means self-responsibility and that it must be used to enlarge the opportunity of the free human being and for the promotion of international cooperation and harmony. Thank you, Ambassador Harman. Our special Eternal Light program today, 40 Voices, written by Mark Siegel, marked the 15th anniversary of the establishment of the State of Israel with a concert of music by the world-famous Renat Choir of Israel under the direction of Gary Bertini. Cantor David Putterman sang the liturgical introduction. Next week, the Eternal Light will present a conversation with Yigal Yadin, the first in a series of four conversation programs with leaders of modern thought. We hope you will be with us then. This is Vic Roby. Our program was directed by Kenneth McGregor and produced by Florence Reef Richmond. Producer for the seminary was Milton E. Krentz. This weekly Peabody Award-winning program is produced under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This pre-recorded program has been an NBC public affairs presentation. Listening to NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.
The Eternal Light. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, the Peabody Award-winning program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today we present the first in a series of four conversations with distinguished leaders of modern thought. Our guest is Yigal Yadin, professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He will be interviewed by NBC commentator Martin Agronsky. Sir, you present me with something of a problem in conducting conversation with you. In your extremely distinguished military career and equally distinguished archaeological career. Are you to be regarded as a student, as a historian, as an archaeologist, or as a general? Well, uh, Mr. Gronsky, this is really a tough uh, question, as if uh, you were asking a, a child who he loves more, his mother or his father. Well, in my case, uh, I feel very happy now being an archaeologist, and the best way I can answer you, your question is just to tell you a story I had the other day. Do. Yeah. Well, there was a reception in the Pentagon, I presume, and the, the room was full with many generals with all their medals and so on, and suddenly came into the room a man in Mufti, and a four-star general approached him and said, I'm General Martin, I represent the Marines, who are you? So he said, well, I'm Professor Smith from Colombia, I represent the culture you defend. So in a way, that's the way I feel now. Well, that answers me rather clearly. I think that I will address you now as Professor Yadin. Now, with a background of a scholarship and an interest in archaeology such as you had, what in the world ever led you to a military career? Well, actually, I began, as, if I may say so, as an archaeologist, because you know that my father, the late Professor Sukenik, was the first arche professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University, where I teach now. And from childhood, I was really interested in archaeology. But uh, living in Palestine at that time, with all the problems we were facing with the Arabs, uh, so actually every boy and girl, all of them really, had to join into a certain defense movement which we call the Haganah, the defense. And there we were exposed, whether we liked it or not, to military problems. Although I began as a messenger and then as a squad leader, but the problems were there. There was nobody really to teach us. So the only way for us was a double one. For me, Personally, since I studied archaeology and studied the Bible and was interested in biblical warfare, I was trying all the time to see what we can learn from ancient uh, books, from the book actually, and so on and so forth, uh, remembering all the time that we were fighting in the same land of our forefathers and there was a continuous line from those days to today. Well, now there's an extraordinary and meteoric rise, really, from being a messenger in the Haganah to being the chief of operations in the Israeli War of Independence. Do you think that your archaeological background led you up that ladder more quickly than might otherwise have been expected to? Well, uh, this might be a dangerous answer because um, some people think that in order to be a, a general, they'll have to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. uh, I was introduced the other day here. Somebody said, this is the Sherlock Holmes of the underground. And I was relieved, really, he didn't say the Sherlock Holmes of the underworld. But the point is that in this particular case, I would say, yes, I never considered myself a professional a soldier. I would say an, an amateur biblical a soldier. And we learned a lot uh, from the Bible, and I was trying, really, to apply this uh, from time to time. On the you other say an amateur biblical soldier, would this apply to all of your colleagues, to your comrades in arms? Yes, I would think this is correct. You see, the point is that uh, whenever we fought in the War of Independence, and even today, everyone is conscious of the fact that he is fighting in the land of the Bible. And since the enemies, geographically at least, hasn't, haven't changed in these days, and everyone knows that wherever he fights now, there was always recorded already a, a battle in the Bible. And in fact, it was that uh, during the war, every time an officer before the war, the battle began, used to read them a certain chapter describing a very battle which took place in the same spot. And that was extremely important from a moral point of view. Well, uh, one hears always the phrase that the Bible became the manual of arms of the Israelis. I mean, is that true or is that a romanticized? Well, it is true in a certain way, I would say, in this way, that the one aspect of it I just mentioned, which was extremely important, this was our secret weapon. Uh, you know, Montgomery and Eisenhower, before the invasion of uh, Normandy, they thought it was worthwhile to quote a passage from the Bible in order to, to boost the morale of the soldiers. But they would look in vain in the Bible to look any reference uh, to Normandy, you see. In our case, there was no problem, and this was important. But there was more to that. By studying the uh, 
the wars described in the Bible, we could really, in many cases, anticipate what the enemy will do because they were facing with the same problem. Well, Professor Yardin, could you give a specific example? I mean, one thinks of uh, David's slingshot and of David and Goliath. One thinks of, uh, oh, the um, trumpet with which... Uh, Joshua blew down the walls of Jericho. Now, what were your equivalents? Well, our equivalents, of course, were a little bit different. For example, I'll give you a specific one. We knew from the Bible that uh, about uh, 850, there was a war between the Syrians of those days and Ahab, king of Israel. And the Bible describes exactly how the Syrians came, uh, the terrain and the way. We were expecting them to do that thing because we knew that this was the only way for them to do Weren't you concerned that they perhaps might have read the Bible? Well, yeah. actually, I wanted them to read the Bible because that would, would make it sure that they'll choose this way because oh. there is no other good way. Unfortunately, at the beginning, they chose another way and we thought really we were in a tough spot because we were ambushing for them on the spot where we thought they'll choose according to the Bible. But then in the middle, they found a mistake, not because they read the Bible, but because they lo were looking at the terrain. They came the other way around and that we were waiting for them there and I think that was one of their our greatest... Uh, well, uh, victory is really on that particular spot, on the Sea of Galilee. You smote them from the rear with a campaign conceived by your forefathers 2,000 years ago. Well, uh, we smote them, whether for the rear or not, but definitely at that time uh, we smote did. Them. We, we did, definitely that. Well, is there any equivalent to the intervention which set aside the Red Sea and accomplished the drowning of the cohorts of the pharaohs? Well, I think it's the same intervention manifested in a different way and manner. Here you had a people who had their beliefs, were, were ready to die and defend their beliefs and what they believed. They fought in the same way their forefathers did. And that, then the intervention came in whatever way you want to explain it. It was there. Would you care to define that intervention? Well, uh, that is really more difficult. I would say that the spirit of the prophets the spirit of the forefathers, as it is expressed in the Bible, was at the back of the mind of everyone who was fighting. He was feeling as if really is the continuing, the same long fight, the same long search for the truth, and at the same time, the fight for existence. And I would say, I think so at least, that that was the interference. You would not feel then that it would be romantic, perhaps, to say that uh, the soldiers whom you led drew sustenance from the Bible and from the whole concept of divine intervention on the side of Israel at the time of the pharaohs? Well, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you an example. For example, our battle against the Egyptians, our code name in our headquarters, which was the code name for the soldiers as well, was called Operation Ten Plagues. Hmm. And we knew that by giving that name, that it was more than any speeches to the soldier. Every soldier who knew that he was taking part in Operation Ten Plagues, remember the Bible on the one hand, knew exactly what he might expect, what he hoped to expect, or at least knew exactly what he wanted to do. And this was extremely important, really, in all the battles, really, which we had. Well, can we move from your military career, sir, to your archaeological career now? <clears throat> I would divide up your archaeological career, if I may, into two eras and to your work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and to your recent discoveries in Bar about Bar Kokhba. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are something that really captured the imagination of the world, and not only archaeologists. They have so many theological, so much theological significance. How do you define the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, as you said, uh, everyone thinks and knows that they are important. You know, somebody called Israel the other day, not the land of milk and honey, uh, but the land of rock and scroll, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, it is true that since their discovery uh, in 1947, and since the first three scrolls were uh, acquired by my father in a very dangerous manner when he went to Bethlehem on the 29th of November, when the state of Israel was created by the United Nations, and since the day when later in 1955, when I was on a lecture tour for the Hebrew University and acquired them miraculously through a, an advertisement in the Wall Street uh, Journal, since those days when all these scrolls have been already published, every scholar, I would say, who deals with the Bible, with the history of the Jewish history and the origin of Christianity, is really studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because for the first time we had here writings of a certain particular Jewish sect, which I would call, which serves now as the missing link 
between Judaism and Christianity. There's a missing link. Well, can you define that more specifically? Well, I would say that, of course, we knew that uh, uh, Christianity was uh, uh, at the beginning really a Jewish uh, group. And, uh, of course, when we look and read in the New Testament today, there are many uh, ideas there which were not found in the teachings of the Jews in Jerusalem. It was always puzzling because we couldn't understand how it came. Some people tried to explain it as if it came through uh, that influence or no, or other. Now, for the first time, I think we are right in saying that in the teaching of this particular sect, we found ideas were current in this part of time uh, in Palestine which might have influenced also the first uh, Christians. One of these ideas that has always interested me is the idea of the two messiahs and the connection to the well-known uh, saying, the aphorism, love thy enemies from the Sermon on the Mount. Could you expand on that a bit? Well, uh, it's a very delicate and uh, complicated uh, subject. I would say only this, that these people who wrote and composed the Dead Sea Scrolls were people who were believing that the end of the days is very near, and that they were similar to many religious groups of that day. But unlike the Jews in Jerusalem, in fact, unlike the Christians, they were expecting really two Messiah rather than one. And actually, I wouldn't like to use the word Messiah with a capital M. What Messiah, of course, meaning in Hebrew, anointed, like Christ is anointed. They were expecting that at the end of the days, Israel will be ruled justly again by two leaders, legitimately anointed, one lay from the house of David and one priest from the house of Aaron. This was the basic belief. And, and this evolved, perhaps, Professor Yadin, and into the concept that in one man there could be embodied both of these. Well, if we, you learn carefully that belief, you might uh, find that it explains many phenomena in the beginning uh, of Christianity and also in Jewish uh, d development, and this will help to understand many things, but that is, of course, a subject which will uh, need a lot more time to develop, naturally. Well, some ten years have passed, really, since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you feel now that you can make a definitive evaluation yet of their importance? Well, I would say, as I said, that for the first time, we have biblical manuscripts going back to 2,000 years ago. We have contemporary documents from the time of early Christianity, and we have documents from the very end of the third, uh, second Commonwealth, uh, Jewish Commonwealth. And therefore, I think no any book of history or book of the history of theology or any manual of this subject which ignores what we learn from these things I don't think he is nearer to the truth and in fact you cannot really do it without it and I think it enriched our understanding mainly not so much of the beliefs themselves but rather of the backgrounds from which all these beliefs sprang has it had any effect on the chronological concept of the time in which Christ lived? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's really just shed light on the background of life at that period. And that, I think, is the main importance. In the philosophical sense? In both. Philosophical, historical, theological, in any aspect. It, it really puts bold, in, in a bolder manner, all the things which we knew from other sources. Yes. Professor Yadin, Bar Kokhba, who was a prince of Israel, led a revolt of the Jews against the Romans in... 132 B.C., I believe, A.D., AD is one of the most fascinating discoveries, really, that you've been involved in. How did that all begin? Well, you know, you, are, you were confused with A.D. and B.C. We are confused all the time, you know, in a country which has a history, B.C. and A.D. I remember one day when we were excavating Chatzor, a guide came. Chatzor being where? Well, in the north of Galilee, an ancient biblical city, the guide showed the tourists there, he showed a building and said, you see this building? This is from the 8th century before B.C. You see, he was so confused. But anyhow, well, you see, this search for the Bakofa uh, documents, uh, which you referred to, Mr. Agronsky, just now, was one of the most fascinating, I would say, expeditions I had the privilege uh, to, to, to take part. How did you... Uh, who, who conceived the idea that there might be these... Uh, well, documents and the, ex where they would be and all that. What is the beginning of the beginning. such an archaeological adventure? Well, the beginning is uh, very simple. You see, the actual first Dead Sea Scrolls were found by Bedouins. Mm -hmm. And when the Bedouins saw that this was good business, even better than to look after their goats to find old manuscripts, they began to roam about in the desert near the Dead Sea. 
And in 1952 already, they found some fragments of documents which was apparent to them immediately that they do not belong to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but rather to the period of Bakova. And this... How did you know that? Well, uh, this was in Jordan, not here, but from what we learned from the scholars, uh, the dates here and there, and the name of Bakova was in the documents, so it obviously belonged to Bakova. Written in Aramaic? Aramaic, uh, well, in fact... Uh, when we discovered later uh, 15 uh, letters of um, Bakova, and the first five letters were in Aramaic, I showed yes. it to our Prime Minister Ben-Gurion. He was enthusiastic to see that, but he was furious. He shouted at me and said, why didn't they write in Hebrew against if these warriors were members of his army of today or members of the cabinet? Showing again that everyone really in Israel <laughs> lives as if he lived then or he connects all the things. But the point is that once these things were apparent, of course, ever was thrilled because Bakova, we knew that he lived there, but actually he was a legendary figure. So we began to send expeditions to the desert already in 1953, but all these expeditions always came back with the news that the caves were empty. Last year, we went again, this time with the help of the Israel army. The caves being where? The caves, well, that is the main point. You see, the area near the Dead Sea is very, very difficult. It's cut by deep canyons, and the caves are right in the middle of the canyons, sometimes 300 feet from the top and 900 feet from the bottom in a steep slope. Well, I've been there. How in the world did you ever get to them? That's well, uh, that was our first question. So what we did, we flew with a helicopter inside the canyons and looked at the cliffs and photographed them, and, and afterwards we collected the pictures. Whenever we saw there was a hole, we knew that there was uh, a hole there, a, a cave. I want to tell you, by the way, Mr. Grosky, that to fly with an Israeli pilot into the canyons with a helicopter is not a very pleasant thing. I mean, not that he's not a good pilot. I was scared to death all the time because while we were flying there, uh, he kept questioning me all the time. He said, when did Bakochva live? Uh, exactly what are you trying to find? And I said to him, keep this question when we land there safely. But as you can see, of course, we landed safely and we managed to find uh, these caves. Now, the second question, of course, was how to reach into this case. Yes, it's most difficult. Well, again, with the help of the soldiers, we built rope, uh, ladders made of ropes. We descended with the ropes. Sometimes we had to walk on a ledge which was not more than one foot wide, and on your right there was a deep uh, valley or deep canyon. You had to walk carefully there. It's not a physical effort. It's a psychological one. Don't look to your right or left, wherever it was the case. We had girls with us, students, you know, and they roamed about in the area as if they were gazelles. And then only we came into the cave where we saw for the first time the first grim sight of the last moment of this desperate war, a heroic war, of Bakofa against the Romans. Well, they must have gone there literally to die because certainly there was no food, and when they ran out of food and water, that would have been the end. Well, actually, they thought they were going to live. They took with them all their belongings. This was a pathetic thing. And they took their letters, they took their documents from Bakofa, but the Romans came after them, pitched their camp on top of the cliff, and when they ran out of the water and uh, food, they died. Actually, in the innermost part of the cave, 150 yards from the face, we found 22 skeletons of men, women, and children who were the children last... Children, too. Yes, children from the age of two and the, till the age of ten. They ran away, but they died there, and this was really, I would say, the last phase of the struggle against uh, the Romans there. And that was the last time, really, that the Jews, since... In, in, in Jewish history that there was a revolt that attempted to reconstitute yes. the state of Israel. Yes, this is the last revolt we call the second revolt and actually 1800 years have passed since since again the sta Jewish state was established here. Uh, and what, did, what did the letters show? Well, this is of course the most important thing of the lot. As I said, we didn't know anything practically about Bakofa. Suddenly we had 15 letters written by Bakofa himself. From there we learned the language, Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. We learned the difficulties and problems he was approaching, not only the Romans. He didn't have food, and all in these letters he tell them to send him food immediately and desperately. But we learned uh, perhaps something which is more important. The character of this war, it was not just a military war, it was a, a war for ideas, a religious, in, in a way, a religious war. Because you see, in the middle of this battle, Bakofa, with all these problems, he writes in one of the letters to the people there, they were living in an oasis near the Dead Sea, there were some uh, palm groves, send me palm branches, citrons, willows, myrtles, the four kinds needed for the Sukkot, for the Feast of Tabernacle. Uh, because at the middle of the battle he needed that for his soldiers, giving you an idea what kind of a man he was, really, and what kind of a battle that uh, was. 
Well, uh, this was... Are there was... any indication that the problems of those times for a president or a commander were similar to those of today? Well, uh, I would say yes. You see, even today, in any nation, things are not so easier. It's not only the enemy from outside that you have to tackle. Sometimes we always find people who wouldn't join you, who don't believe in these beliefs. They prefer, rather, the material comforts of the country. And in one of the most dramatic, perhaps, uh, letters of uh, Bakochwa, he writes to some of the people there, in really in colloquial, simple language. He said to them, you sit, you eat, you drink out of the property of the house of Israel and you don't bother about your fighting uh, soldiers. This is really uh, so dramatic and luckily I must say that today really no prime minister or commander of the Israel has to write such letters, luckily I would say. Ben-Gurion feels that they're past that, is that it? Yes, I think he passed it. He passed that experience already. Is there any correlation between the Bar Kokhba letters and the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, there is and there is not. First of all, these letters also have been found in the Dead Sea area, but there is a difference. The people of the Dead Sea Scrolls ran into this area because they wanted to run away from society. They thought they were going to create new society in the desert, far away from the crowd. These people ran into these caves because they ran away from their enemies, the Romans, and actually they ran to the cave as a place of refuge. So this is really only a very, uh, not a really similarity, but it's interesting. The other similar, the connection is that these documents are from 60 years after the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is very important because all the documents we have, most of them are dated. They are, if it's a year before Bakofa, we had a big archive of, of documents. It's dated to the, the, the king of the Hadrian, the Roman king. Now, since we know their date and we can compare the script there, it will help a lot also people to compare it with the Dead Sea Scrolls script. I had meant to ask you now, the script, is this Aramaic or Hebrew? Well, actually, the Aramaic and Hebrew script was the same. It's really the language was different. And it is astonishing that the script there, both in the Aramaic and the Hebrew, is exactly the script that we use today. I have a daughter of 12 years old. She's not an archaeologist. Actually, she doesn't even want to be an archaeologist. When I brought the first document of Bakochla home, Although it was written 1,800 years ago, she began to read it as if it was a textbook in her school, you see. Right. And that is the amazing thing, and this is another thing of the spirit, I think, what strengthens the spirit of the people there. They see the continuity all the time, wherever they go there, whatever they do there. Tell me, is there anything in the letters that illustrated the way people lived in those times, yes. or the nature of those people? Well, yes, actually, as I said, these people ran into the caves not because they didn't go there to die. They thought the day will come, they'll live. So therefore, they took with them all their belongings. And I mentioned the document until now, but actually, there were many other things we found. You see, the area there is very dry. The area is dry. Everything is preserved. Every scrap of paper is preserved as if it was written yesterday. And we were lucky to find in the caves. Of course, before they died, they buried them among the rocks. We found many textiles, their clothing. Interestingly enough, again, never we found in the clothing mixture of linen and wool, which was against the Jewish law. They were very observant. Oh. Always either they were made of wool or linen. We found their glass utensils, balls made of wood. We found their knives with everything. And since we know the exact date of that, this helps us today to reconstruct not only the spiritual and historical period, but also the material background of the whole thing. And this is also very important from an archaeological point of view. You mentioned at one point when I was in Israel and you held a news conference on uh, the Bar Kokhba findings, uh, the contents of a woman's pack pocketbook That's which right. fascinated me. Uh, well, uh, uh, one of the finds which we found only recently in the second expedition when we went, as you mentioned, is we found an archive which belonged to a certain woman. She kept all her documents there, together with, with her sandals, which we found, the skeins of wool, and the knife. And this is fascinating archive, because we can not only learn her history, which is not so important. We know exactly who her mother was and her father, how many husbands she had, two husbands, how many children, what the problems she had. She went to court, and, and of course, while reading these documents, you have all the data about this period. But uh, we learned from these uh, documents as well all the many historical things because, you see, every document begins with a date. And she refers to the, to the Roman governor over her day. She mentioned all the names of the uh, area in the vicinity, who was there, and so on. And this really will help us to uh, reconstruct the whole thing. In the meantime, I'm very fond, I must say, of this woman 
We know her name, BAFTA, the pupil of the eye, not only because she, well, caused these documents to preserve, but through her, and through her intimate biography that we know today, we can reconstruct also the life of the people, the ordinary people, not only of Bakofa, who lived in this period, without whom he wouldn't be able really to fight. Professor Yadin, will you forgive me a frivolous question? Do we learn also that women jam their pocketbooks as full men as they do now? Well, uh, this particular woman definitely did that. Every scrap of, scrap of paper that she gets hold of through her life, she kept it, and that's why we're lucky we found these things. Any lipstick and any keys? Well, uh, you don't know what you were asking. In her bag, together with all these things, we found a strange thing. It shows yeah. that woman's nature, not only human nature, remains the same. She knew that she was running into a dark cave. She knew that the Romans will be after it. Nevertheless, together with all the documents, she didn't forget to take with her one thing. She took a mirror, and we found this mirror uh, uh, there together. And women's nature certainly has changed. That's right, yes. What would you say to be more serious, Professor Yadin, should be the aim of archaeology today? Well, I would say this. I think we have reached a point that the aim of archaeology is really not only to go and dig and find old things. You see, in Israel, everyone can be an archaeologist of that type. The aim is really to find things which will teach you. And I would say this. One archaeologist once told a man who visited his site, he said, what can we learn from what we, you, saw, you found? He said, we can learn that a glorious past is ahead of us. I would say that the aim of archaeology is to show people that a glorious future is also ahead of us. And how would you derive that? Well, by learning from what happened. You see, people say that man learns from experience, but that is how the fool does. I think the wise man should learn also from the experience of others. And if we shall do that, I'm sure we shall have a much more glorious future ahead of us. Do you, are you optimistic at the capacity of contemporary man to do that? Well, I'm sure about that. If he'll stick to some ideals that his forefathers stuck to them, and he shall be stubborn enough and ready to die in d their defense. Well, thank you very much, Professor Yadin, for a very illuminating examination of the past and the future. If you would like a copy of today's program, please send your name and address with 10 cents to cover the cost of postage and handling to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. Our Eternal Light program today was the first in a series of four conversations with distinguished leaders of modern thought. Our guest was Yigael Yadin, professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University. He was interviewed by NBC News commentator Martin Agronsky. Editorial consultant for this program was Irv Tunick. We invite you to join us next week at this same time for a conversation with Dr. Oscar Hanlon, Winthrop Professor of History at Harvard University and Pulitzer Prize winning author. This is Vic Roby. This weekly Peabody Award-winning program is produced under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This pre-recorded program has been an NBC Public Affairs presentation. This is the NBC Radio Network. In Psalm 63, David said, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips, when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. To help you focus your thoughts upon God at the close of this day, we bring you this devotional meditation from Morning and Evening by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the 19th century. This evening's text comes from John chapter 5 and verse 39.
Search the Scriptures. The Greek word here rendered search signifies a strict, close, diligent, curious search, such as men make when they are seeking gold, or hunters when they are in earnest after game. We must not rest content with having given a superficial reading to a chapter or two, but with the candle of the Spirit we must deliberately seek out the hidden meaning of the Word. Holy Scripture requires searching. Much of it can only be learned by careful study. There is milk for babes, but also meat for strong men. The rabbis wisely say that a mountain of matter hangs upon every word, yea, upon every title of Scripture. Tertullian exclaims, I adore the fullness of the Scriptures. No man who merely skims the book of God can profit thereby. We must dig and mine until we obtain the hid treasure. The door of the word opens only to the key of diligence. The scriptures claim searching. They are the writings of God, bearing the divine stamp and imprimatur. Who shall dare to treat them with levity? He who despises them despises the God who wrote them. God forbid that any of us should leave our Bibles to become swift witnesses against us in the great day of account. The word of God will repay searching. God does not bid us sift a mountain of chaff with here and there a grain of wheat in it, but the Bible is winnowed corn. We have but to open the granary door and find it. Scripture grows upon the student. It is full of surprises. Under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, to the searching eye it glows with splendor of revelation, like a vast temple paved with wrought gold and roofed with rubies, emeralds, and all manner of gems. No merchandise like the merchandise of Scripture truth. Lastly, the Scriptures reveal Jesus. They are they which testify of me. No more powerful motive can be urged upon Bible readers than this. He who finds Jesus finds life, heaven, all things. Happy he who, searching his Bible, discovers his Savior. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each evening at this same time for Morning and Evening. <laughs>